Hi, I'm Larzen. This is my land. In my land, I get to do pretty much whatever I want. And today I'm going to tell you everything I could find about Magical Mystery Tour. And you're going to listen because it's my land. Now, you might be wondering why Magical Mystery Tour. So I'll spoil it for you. The album was almost universally praised. Critics said that it was better than Sgt. Pepper. The movie was such a disaster that everyone forgets that first part. Welcome to Annoying Memos Land. Beep -ity -beep -ity -beep -ity -beep -beep. If you're new here, I talk mostly about the Beatles, but I'm also interested in TV and movies, but I haven't gotten around to that yet because I've been working on a video essay on the TV show Lost for so long now that if I don't mention it in every video I do, I will be run over by a lawnmower during a lively office party and that dude got fired. <sighs> I'm a freelancer. Firing myself would be humiliating. I don't have much of an upload schedule. As you can see, longer things take longer time and I usually stick with long stuff. So I come around when I come around, but I do come around. Follow me on social media. I am at This Is Larsland on everything. I will interact with you on Twitter. I would absolutely love it if y'all would like and subscribe and all of that jazz. It helps me a lot more than you think it does. And you get all of this for free. So I had to get a tooth pulled. Okay, fine, fine. I have genetically awful teeth. We're gonna pretend it's adorable and that it's not redneck and that it's totally normal. I lost a Nicole Byers point. You're tall, that's luxurious. <laughs> you have red hair, how exotic. You have all your teeth, mm. what a treat. <sighs> Now let's go back to my land. Ooh, good start, good start. Quick short video breakdown. One, everything about the album. Two, let's listen to the album. Three, everything about the movie. Four, let's watch the movie. And a deleted scene. This is so cool. Oh, that's so cool. I can't believe I found this. Yes, that's right. This is two videos in one because I got complaints that I talked too much and I thought, let's just really show them how it's done. Away in the sky, beyond the clouds, live four or five magicians. By casting wonderful spells, they turn the most ordinary coach trip into a magical mystery tour. If you let yourself go, they will take you away to marvelous places. Maybe you've been on a magical mystery tour without even realizing it. Are you ready to go? Splendid. The story begins now. On April 11th, 1967, Paul McCartney came up with the idea for Magical Mystery Tour on his way home from a trip to the U.S. to see his soon-to-be fiance, Jane Asher. Mal Evans was with him. Coach tours were a common vacation, especially for the boys growing up, and you'd travel around the countryside. It was an affordable way to get out of the house and get your kids to hang out with other kids and stop bothering you while you get drunk for a day. It seems totally normal. But there were also things called mystery tours. So you'd get on the bus, but where do you go? Nobody knows. And that's this movie, but this one is magical. While I really truly do love my, but that's a different video shtick, I have to spend some time talking about the tragic untimely death of the Beatles beloved manager, Brian Epstein. A video about him truly is a different video, perhaps more than one, he deserves that much. So today I'm only talking about his death. This is the shortest Cliff's Notes version that I could give you guys because I can't talk about Magical Mystery Tour without talking about this. Things are gonna get really depressing for a few minutes. Just excuse any sort of YouTube approved speech or censorship because that's YouTube's fault, not mine. Brian's history with medication to cope with stress, severe insomnia and depression led him to seek professional institutionalized help a few times. In the time leading up to Magical Mystery Tour, that is 1967, things were already really wild. The Beatles contract with Brian was nearing an end and the group had already decided to stop touring. Booking tours was Brian's bread and butter. That's how he made the band money. He had concerns about whether or not his contract would be renewed. With his added worry, Brian spied ruled further. On August 27th, 1967, he was found lifeless in his London apartment, 24 Chapel Street. It was an apparent accidental overdose of a combination of medication and alcohol. Some people have said that this was not an accident that he chose to leave as there have been tendencies and notes indicating such in the past, but that is up to speculation. Either way, it is incredibly tragic and it broke the Beatles' hearts. They had what I thought was a sort of presence, and uh, this is a terrible, vague term, star quality. Whatever that is, they had it. Or I, I sensed that they had it. Like I said in one of my recent videos, he was the rubber band that held the bunch of pencils together. 
Great analogy. Makes sense. People love it. <laughs> His death left the Beatles unmoored. John, where would you be today without Mr. Epstein? I don't know. They had planned to go on a retreat with Maharishi Maharishi Yogi after hearing him speak in Wales, something that they had excitedly told Brian about and he was supposed to come with them. He was also excited to learn. I understand that Mr. Epstein was to be initiated here tomorrow. Yes. Mm. Well, as, as much as we'd learned about spiritualism and various things of that nature, then we'd tried to pass on to him and he was equally as interested as we are. He, he wanted to know about life as much as we do. The night of Brian's death, they spoke with Maharishi and he offered them support. Could I ask you what he, what advice he offered you? Not to get overwhelmed by grief and to whatever thoughts we have of Brian, to keep them happy because any thoughts we have of, have of him will travel to him wherever he is. I'm gonna go off script for just a second because I'm not physically reading from them. I have them all on my script, but there are, f I'm, ah, Jesus, don't do this again. Don't do this again. You had it, you can do this. You got this, you got this bitch. One of them went in the trash can. <laughs> Three not pictured. I am reading from 12 books. So um, there's a lot of people and authors involved. And I think maybe I should just give you a little rundown of who I'm reading from and what's going on, okay? Okay, first we've got the Beatles anthology that's written by the Beatles. It also has interviews from Neil Aspinall, Mal Evans. Neil Aspinall was a childhood friend of the Beatles, very close with George. He was originally the Beatles road manager, then Mal Evans was hired on as roadie. So Neil became a personal assistant and was eventually promoted to chief executive officer of Apple because the Beatles only employed their friends. They didn't employ professionals. <laughs> Jeff Emmerich, the Beatles engineer. George Martin, the Beatles producer. Alan Clayson, a biographer who wrote about Ringo Starr. Peter Asher, he was very close with the Beatles, the brother of Paul's fiance, Jane Asher, and a lifelong friend of Paul's. He's also one half of Peter and Gordon. That's could be a different video. Pete Shodden and Nicholas Sch Schaffner. Pete Shodden was John Lennon's childhood best friend and he also worked for them. Pete managed Apple Boutique and then later became the managing director of Apple Corps. So Schaffner was just a writer. Mark Lewison, Beatles biographer, visualizing the Beatles. It is by John Pring and Rob Thomas. They are journalists for The Guardian. Magical Mystery Tours by Tony Bramwell. Tony Bramwell originally worked for Brian Epstein at NEMS and then later worked for the Beatles at Apple. And then Tony Barrow was an English press officer who worked with the Beatles from 1962 to 1968 and coined the term the Fab Four. So these are our people, okay? This is who we're hearing from. Tony Bramwell says, Paul said, if the others clear off to India again now on another meditation trip, I think there's a very real danger that we'll never come back together again as a working group. On the other hand, if I can persuade them today that we go straight into shooting this film, it could save the Beatles. It's September 1st, Paul brings the Beatles over to his house and they talk about what to do next. They had that plan to go on that yoga trip, but Paul thought, that's a bad idea. Tony Barrow says, according to Paul, Epi had been put in the picture about Magical Mystery Tour within the last week of his life and reacted very positively, but of course his sudden death put a different complexion on everything. When the rest arrived for the Cavendish Avenue Summit meeting, Paul's now or never approach sent an infectious vibration of excitement through all of us in the room. Then John asked quietly, we can do all of this without Brian? Paul reminded him that Epstein's five-year contract was about to run out and the group had already agreed among themselves that it would not be renewed. In all of my research, which is a lot because this is a 40 page script, <laughs> Barrow's book is the only one I found to be so firm on this point. I haven't looked into it enough to tell you which way or another and that is in fact, sorry, different video, okay? But that's the only one where I heard definitive, he's going. I also read that Paul never got a chance to talk to Brian about the movie, so there's that as well. Tony Bramwell says, George said, without Brian, we're dead. Paul said, no, we're not. We just have to get on with it. We'll have to delegate. That's very Paul. Paul says they go ahead and go ahead they do. Recording began April 25th with MMT, and I might use MMT interchangeably with Magical Mystery Tour. I will always clarify which one I'm talking about. This time, it's the song. They're recording. Magical Mystery Tour, the song. And I don't wanna hear any gripes about the word album right now. You wait until we get to the LPEP situation and then you gripe, 
Gripe away, my loves. But recording didn't really get underway until August and continued sporadically through September and wrapped in October. Mixing went until November. I Initially, I was going to go day by day, but even for me, I was like, that's a little bit boring, so let's not. <laughs> I'll give you some of the highlights. Friendly reminder that the song-specific information comes when we're listening. Jeff Emmerich says, with the benefit of hindsight, it's obvious that we went back into the studio way too soon. Paul was the only one with any creative energy left, and he was determined to top Pepper. The others didn't seem to care nearly as much. But in the face of John's excessive drug taking and George's spiritual journey eastward, Paul had taken control of the band's direction so firmly that the others didn't even question the wisdom of returning to work right away. Not only was the band exhausted, but recreational activities had started to seep into the studio. Jeff says, and we'll hear from him quite a bit here in the first section, perhaps because of their drug intake, the Beatles started getting a bit complacent and lazy around this time, and their concentration was dwindling. Actually, it had never been all that great, especially when they were doing backing tracks. They'd get halfway through and one of them would forget what it was they were supposed to do. That's why it would often require dozens of takes before or we'd get something usable. The usual culprit was John. His mind would often just wander or else he and Paul would get an attack of giggles, most often at the certain point in the evening when they'd had a smoke of pot. But the main problem was that we simply weren't fresh. And as a result, the recordings themselves sound kind of tired. John's I Am The Walrus could have been a track on Pepper, I suppose, but it wouldn't have been a particularly outstanding one. Few of the other songs on either Magical Mystery Tour or Yellow Submarine would have fit. To some degree, the Beatles were a little too overconfident about their ability at that point in time. I so so couldn't disagree more. They felt they could get away with recording almost anything and that the public would accept it, but it wasn't as simple as that. Certainly, they had no appreciation of what they had been doing in the control room during Pepper and most of the time and effort we had devoted to creating the icing on the cake, the sounds in the atmosphere. They viewed what we were doing as normal, whereas in reality, we were tearing our hair out a lot of the time. Sadly, Pepper was the last Beatles album where all four band members worked like a team. There would still be good days ahead, but they would occur less frequently. The cracks were beginning to appear intentions were starting to bubble to the surface. Jeff in general is kind of a negative anxiety ridden person and you see it throughout the book. So I didn't hear this level of cracks showing from anywhere else. <laughs> the overwhelmed and overtired musicians worked tirelessly on their new material. Despite what Jeff says, I Am The Walrus was meticulously crafted by John. The Fool on the Hill was obsessively perfected by Paul. It's understandably frustrating, but also unsurprising that the Beatles would eventually have a less than stellar evening in the studio. May 9th, 1967 is widely regarded as the worst day for the Beatles in studio. Not for this album, for the entire time ever, the whole time. It's a well-known story. Let me tell you what Jeff said about it. It was around this time that the warning signs were beginning to appear. The Beatles turned up the studio unusually late one night, near midnight, and spent some seven hours in a stoned haze, jamming endlessly and pointlessly. In search of a new kind of high, Lennon had brought a big strobe light in. So at one point they turned out the lights and started running around as if they were in an old film. That lasted for about five minutes, after which everyone started complaining of a headache. All four of them were completely out of it, tripping on acid, probably. And it was the first Beatles session I'd ever attended where absolutely nothing was accomplished. Perhaps the first seeds of what was to become the instrumental track flying were planted that night, but for the most part, it was just them being silly, much to the annoyance of George Martin, who was constantly bumming cigarettes off me, a sure sign of his frustration. He tried to point out to John, Paul, and George that their guitars weren't even in tune, but giggling like children, they brushed him off, saying, that's okay, we're just doing a demo. That in itself was a strange thing to say, since we all know too well that anything the Beatles recorded might become part of of a finished product, which was the reason we constantly rolled tape and rarely erased anything. But they were so stoned that night, we couldn't communicate with them at all. Richard Lush and I understood by this point, jamming was now the process by which they got inspiration and created new songs. But George Martin, who was not used to working this way, just didn't get it. Seven hours of playing aimlessly with out of tune guitars was not the way he would be running a session, but they were clearly in control now. They did as they liked. Making matters worse, George couldn't turn around and tell them off because he was clearly scared of being fired. The Beatles were independent clients of his, so he had to tread carefully. Certainly, they were the one artist he did not want to lose. As midnight turned to 1 a.m., a disgruntled George Martin turned to me in the control room and said, what am I here for anyway? I had no answer. George knew that he had no function to serve on sessions like this. He was really just there to protect Eric's interest. With that, he simply got up and left without even bothering to get on the talk back and say goodnight to the four Beatles, who continued jamming away in a darkened studio tube below, oblivious. A few hours later, a weary, bored-to-teared Richard repeated the producer's question to me verbatim, even down to George
words affected upper class accent. I had to laugh after a moment's thought. The only response I could come up with was, you're right, come on, let's go. This is ridiculous. With that, we did what would have been unthinkable just a few short months ago. We walked out on a Beatles session. We didn't say a word to them either. We just left. On our way out, we told the commissioner that things had gotten out of hand and that we were going home even though the group were still playing. We were a bit worried about how we would break the news to them and how they might react, but his response was a casual, okay, I'll give them another half hour and then I'll go tell them that we're closing up and they have to leave. The next day, we couldn't wait to find out what happened. We figured we'd get some grief about it, but nothing was ever said. The four Beatles were obviously too embarrassed to admit that we'd abandoned them, or more likely, too stoned to remember. Surprisingly, most of their post-pepper work was done in Studio 3, which was considerably smaller than Studio 2 and therefore even more confining, both physically and aesthetically. Presumably, George Martin simply couldn't book Studio 2 for the times the Beatles wanted, and as a result, they also began working in outside studios more and more. Beyond being a mammoth waste of time and energy, those kinds of all-night sessions were starting to become a problem for the EMI management because they were losing staff during the day. After all, we had to sleep sometime. There was also a controversy with the accounting department about the long hours we were doing during Beatles sessions. The bean counters finally realized that we were starting late in the afternoon and said the usual nine in the morning and they made noises about not paying us overtime anymore. There was no precedent for what we were doing. No one at Abbey Road had worked those kinds of hours before so no one had earned the kinds of overtime pay we were earning, not that we got paid all that much. In the end, there was so much staff resistance that we threatened to go out on strike and the idea was quietly dropped. It was around this time that the Beatles began frequenting outside studios more and more for a variety of reasons. Perhaps they were searching for new sounds or perhaps they simply had cabin fever and were sick of staring at the same four walls. There really weren't any amenities at Abbey Road. There were no couches or armchairs in our cramped control rooms, just a few uncomfortable hard chairs. In contrast, when they went into Olympic or Trident, there would be large control rooms with plush leather sofas and comfortable chairs to sit in, all accented by low lighting and a modern decor. The only way we could get any subdued lighting in our control room was to turn off all the lights and open the front panels of the tape recorders. The glowing tubes inside would give us just enough light that you didn't bump into each other. In addition, by mid-1967, every other major studio in London had an eight-track machine, and we still only had a four-track, which made us seem like we were lagging far behind. The reluctance to move up to eight-track was a reflection of EMI's staid policy of never adopting a technology before all the technical staff up at corporate headquarters had thoroughly examined it from every conceivable point of view. Whenever we'd get a new piece of gear in, we weren't even allowed to use it until it had been completely disassembled and reassembled by the chief technical engineer. It was a ridiculous ridiculous position to take, especially in an industry where change was beginning to happen so quickly, but the studio was never really meant to be profit-making anyway. In essence, it was viewed as a research facility. EMI's real profits had come out of building radios and radar for military applications, not civilian use. There was another factor that led the Beatles away from Abbey Road. The staff at the other studios gave the appearance of being hipper than we were. No other recording studio in swinging London had a dress code, much less one that required the producers and balance engineers to wear jacket and ties. There was also a much more relaxed attitude toward drugs in other studios, and it wouldn't surprise me if the staff at those facilities would partake with clients, so perhaps the Beatles related to the other engineers better. There's nothing a stoner loves more than another stoner. I imagine they thought it was really cool to share a joint with the control room staff. In contrast, we must have seemed really straight and square. But however far the Beatles would stray, they kept coming back right up until their last album together, which they would even name after the location of the studio. For one simple reason, they couldn't get the same sound anywhere else. Unhip as we might have been, we delivered the goods. It's no coincidence that the vast majority of Beatles hits were recorded at Abbey Road. Jeff writes over and over that the cracks were showing. Sorry, I have a cough drop because I'm going to lose my voice. I don't have a good voice. I've damaged vocal cords. But he also noted how close the group were and wondered if they got separation anxiety. I sometimes wondered what the Beatles did on the nights when they weren't working. Did they go around to one another's houses? Did they feel lost without one another? After all, they had gotten so used to being together while working in the studio every night during the long months of Pepper. It was likely that Paul was the one who missed the camaraderie the most because he was the workaholic in the group. It came as no surprise that he was the main motivator behind Magical Mystery Tour. People don't realize how hard the Beatles worked in the studio and on the road, not just physically, but psychologically and mentally, it had to be incredibly wearying. Now it was time for them to let off some steam. All throughout the spring and summer of 1967, the prevalent feeling in the group seemed to be, after all of those years of hard work, now it's time to play. On May 11th, they record and mix Baby You're a Rich Man at Olympic Sound Studios, not EMI. They start at 9 p.m. and the record is finished completely 
by 3 a.m. This song was originally slated for Yellow Submarine and it made it in the film, but not before being snagged as a B-side for All You Need Is Love, released on July 7th. There's also a possibility that Jagger sang backing vocals on it because of a tape box labeled The Beatles Plus Mick Jagger? Question mark. Let's skip ahead to August 22nd through 23rd. The Beatles are at Chapel Recording Studios, a studio that George Martin used when Abbey Road was booked. Here, they recorded Your Mother Should Know. The August 23 session was the last one before Brian Epstein died. While he spent less and less time in the studio these days, he'd actually visited during that session. He was reported to have looked extremely down and in a bad mood. He stood in the back and listened to the recordings and didn't say much. He passed away four days later. Here it is. On September 1st, the Bugs meet at St. John's Wood, Paul's house, and decide a few things, many of which are different videos. But for our purposes, the one that matters is that they delayed their planned meditation trip with Maharishi and they'd push forward with MMT, the album and the movie actually. Bramwell says, they were under the microscope now with the world looking to see what would happen next. George said, maybe we need some space. Let's go to India. Before Brian's death, following their induction by the Maharishi at the level one boot camp in Wales, it had been their intention to fly almost immediately to the ashram in the foothills of the Himalayas to immerse themselves for at least six months in meditation at level two while the lessons of Maharishi had taught them were still fresh in their minds. But Paul questioned whether this activity would now appear a little flaky to the rest of the world. They would be gone for months at an exceptionally crucial time just when they needed to get a grip on reality. George thought it would do them good to get away and meditate. He said that there was nothing flaky about it. He was convinced that the Maharishi was misunderstood. George and Patty had already been to India where George had done some recording of Indian music and had gotten to know the people in the country. Their culture is different from ours, he said. They're deeper and know things on a different philosophical lesson. Enthusiastically, he exaggerated. The yogis were practically magic. They could fly. They could read your mind. Learning all of this could surely help them enormously in business. Yeah, that's what we need learning how to read people's minds so as we can tell if we're being ripped off, John said. They argued it back and forth for a while, but ultimately they all agreed that the trip to the ashram would have to be put on hold. Next topic, said Paul, who, as he often did, acted as chairman. The next topic was the Magical Mystery Tour film, which on paper sounded original and creative in all of those artistic things, but which looked as if it might turn out to be a nightmare. Alistair Taylor, who is... I'm gonna find an actual definition for all of these folks... Alistair Taylor, which was Brian's personal assistant, was sent off to hire a 60-seater coach for the mystery tour. Personally, I thought that filling it with an ill-assorted crowd in fancy dress and driving it here and there and anywhere without... <sighs> Come on. Just put in everywhere and just just reference it directly. How did I not catch that the first time I read this? <laughs> Without an itinerary was bound to be seen by the media as a bit airy fairy and ripe for a well-placed custard pie, unless the lads looked and sounded confident that it was all going to be a logical sequel to Sergeant Pepper. It's going to be great, Paul said, and they all nodded in agreement. The title track to Magical Mystery Tour was already in the can and sessions for the rest of the soundtrack were booked at Abbey Road. They needed a script, they needed more songs, they needed organization, they needed Brian. Once again, he says that they're booked at Abbey Road. We know that there was a little waffling there. There are some laps and facts. I'm giving you everything I got. September 8th, they work on Aerial Tour Instrumental, which became Flying. Flying was the first released Beatles instrumental, but the Beatles' first instrumental was Cry for a Shadow, recorded in 1961 with Tony Sheridan. Flying is also the first song composed by all four buggos, as I wrote in this script. On September 16th, Ken Scott was promoted to Balance Engineer. However, on September 25th and 26th, Ken Scott took over in George Martin's absence. The recording sessions went on. Diligent and painstaking details were worked out over and over again on Walrus and Fool on the Hill. They keep showing up and going over things. I am the walrus, fool on the hill, your mother should know, flying, and Blue Jay Way were worked over and over in the studio until they finally met the standards of the world's greatest band. George Martin and Jeff actually were not over the moon with the results. George Martin says, I tended to lay back on Magical Mystery Tour and let them have their head. Some of the sounds weren't very good. Some were brilliant, but some were bloody awful. I Am The Walrus was organized. It was organized chaos. I'm proud of that. But there was also disorganized chaos that I'm not very proud of. Once again, I want to reiterate, this was not how they felt at the time. These are all interviews looking back. I believe firmly that this is only because of the film's critical reception, not because of the album. It is a bad taste association thing. Now let's talk about the LP versus EP. For the purposes of Lars Land, it is an album. I said this in my first Magical Mystery Tour video and people did not like that at all, but it is the law here, 
okay? However, I'd like to explain this little debacle and because I am a dumb donkey, I'm going to have Mal Evans, Neil Aspinall, and Mark Lewison explain this for me because it is definitely better than what I originally wrote. By the way, some of these quotes are attributed to Neil and Mal and that's because these were articles written by them in Beatles Book Monthly. Neil and Mal say, the big problem was to present these recordings to the public in the most suitable way. There was too much music to fit on a seven inch EP disc and not enough to fill a full length 12 inch LP exclamation point. At one stage, the proposal was to use a seven inch record at LP speed, rather like the special discs the Beatles have made for fan club distribution each Christmas. There was a technical problem here. George Martin advised us that there would be a loss of volume on a seven inch LP record. In addition, some of us were against the idea because it would mean that people with auto change record players would have to fiddle about with the speed control or play the magical mystery tour disc in a stack of LP albums instead of with singles and EPs. It was not until the beginning of November that everybody agreed on how the thing should should be solved. And Lewison takes over now. He says, Magical Mystery Tour would be packaged as a hitherto untried double EP set in a heavy duty gatefold sleeve with a 28 page booklet, some pages in color, including all of the song lyrics. The price of this superb package was to be 19 shillings six D. What's D? double the price of a typical album. That was the UK release though. With Capitol Records finding the North American market to be a little too unpredictable for a double EP set. EPs are super popular in Britain at this point, but they hadn't taken off in the US. So Capitol puts the MMT songs on one side and picked non Sgt. Pepper recent releases to put on the other side. And guys, it was like, bangers. Hello Goodbye, Strawberry Fields Forever, Penny Lane, Baby You're a Rich Man, and All You Need Is Love. What a roster. Lewison says, Penny Lane, Baby You're a Rich Man, and All You Need Is Love, these three were issued in a duophonic form, i.e. mock stereo, since true stereo mixes had not yet been made for them. The LP idea was a good one, even if it wasn't what the Beatles themselves wanted, and imports soon found their way into Britain. On 19 November 1976, EMI issued it in the UK, the capital version with the three duophonic songs, to satisfy public demand. So the box set, I'm just gonna call it the box set because double EP with booklet, doesn't quite roll off the tongue. So the box set has 24 pages, but you'll also see 28 page booklet source because there are 28 pages, including the gatefold sleeves and lyrics page. The album cover designed by John Van Hammersfeld, Hammersfeld something, the head of Capitol's art department, marked the first time the Beatles faces were obscured on the album cover. Capitol was sketched out about covering the Beatles faces because well, Look at those boys, aren't they pretty? Why would we ever hide their faces? So he decided to edit the cover to highlight the songs. I'm not saying anything, I'm not, but it is not the most attractive Beatles cover. So I am saying that, actually I am saying something. <laughs> Facty facts, favorite bit. The album, the album, the LP was released November 27th, 1967 in the US. The album came first. The UK double EP was released December 8th, 1967. Baby, it is an album. For three weeks, it was the highest selling capital LP taking the top spot for eight weeks on the charts. It was nominated for Grammy Album of the Year in 1969. The double EP sold more than 500,000 copies in the UK and it overthrew Hello Goodbye for a week. The album charted second in UK, first in the US, second in France, third in Australia and eighth in Germany. The album went certified gold in Germany and Argentina, platinum in Australia and UK, four times platinum in Canada and six times platinum in the US. The album had four number one hits, All You Need Is Love, Baby You're a Rich Man, I Am the Walrus and Hello Goodbye, two number two hits in Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields Forever. It was the first Beatles EP to be issued in both mono and stereo. Magical Mystery Tour entered the charts on December 13th and spent 12 weeks in the top 40. Album reception, contemporary review Views were glowing. NME's Nick Logan said the Beatles were at it again, stretching pop music to its limits. Said the band was out there in front, leaving the rest of us in their wake. The US publication Saturday Review's Mike John said this was the Beatles' best work yet, better than Sgt. Pepper. One of the only negative reviews came from Richard Goldstein of the New York Times, lamenting true rock values and studio effects, calling the album and its eccentric packaging a fascination with motif. Can't think big in this world, not in New York City. He says, does it sound like heresy to say that the Beatles write material which is literate, courageous, genuine, but spotty? It shouldn't, they are inspired posers, but we must keep our heads on the music, not their incarnations. 
Okay. Perhaps most importantly, this was John's favorite album. I love what he said about it. Let me find my quote. We're going to play a track from Magical Mystery Tour, which is one of my favorite albums because it was so weird. I think that's worth saying something. And baby, I am filming this three days before John's birthday. So John, we honor you today. It is one of your favorite albums. It's one of mine too. I mean, I'll, I have a really hard time ranking the albums, but it's one of mine too. Now let's listen. Mm. Sorry, I know it's never a good sign to see editing Lars and definitely not when it's this early in a video yet. Here I am. I just submitted my seventh version of this video to YouTube's copyright system. Nothing more than three seconds of music. Nothing more than seven uninterrupted seconds of the movie. Nothing ridiculous at all. I decided that I would formally apologize that there's not enough music in this video. I know that, you know that, and frankly, YouTube knows that. It's not fair that I can talk about this and not show you precisely everything that we should be enjoying about the hard work that went into this absolute clusterfuck of a magnificent project. It's ridiculous. And I feel angry that I have to do this. I feel sorry that I have to give you the bad version of my project. I feel bad that this is the way that I have to do this. The fact that I have had to chop out so much of I Am The Walrus really upsets me because the way that I started to feel about this song changed as I was working on this project. Like, I, and I can't show you that because of copyright. Yeah, I have... <laughs> My next, I my next two like video ideas are all copyright based. I'm gonna be an asshole about this, I think. <laughs> plus song facts and info. Magical Mystery Tour. The first track to be recorded for Magical Mystery Tour was the title song and everyone was quite up for that session which began, as usual, late in the evening. There was a long period of rehearsal punctuated by discussion about the various scenes they wanted to shoot for the film. Paul's vague concept, and it was quite vague at that point, was to have the four Beatles and a group of actors pile on a coach, destination unknown, in the emulation of the bus trip to nowhere that was so popular in England in the 50s and 60s, really just an excuse for an extended booze up on wheels. Finally, a backing track was laid down with Paul thumping away at the piano. Once that was done, Richard raided the EMI archives, found a tape of transportation effects recorded on location by Stuart Eltham. Eltham? Eltham. There you go. Stuart Eltham, which I put into a loop complete with the sounds of the buses whizzing by in glorious stereo panning from right to left. Paul had decided to add brass to the Magical Mystery Tour theme song, including the same kind of Brandenburg concerto type piccolo trumpets he had used in Penny Lane. Since I had recorded every note of the track, I naturally assumed that I would be engineering the overdub, but EMI's executive, in their infinite wisdom, months before I had been booked to record an eccentric group called the Edge Cutler and the Wurzels doing a gig in a pub in Somerset. Edge had recently recently had a number one hit in England with a sing-along I'd recorded called The Drink Up Thy Zyder. Because of the success of that single, the band's management had pre-booked me to record their live gig, but it happened to fall on the same evening that the brass was to be added to Magical Mystery Tour, and despite my protests, I was told in no uncertain terms by the studio management that I would be recording Edge Cutler instead of the Beatles. Incredibly, they took me off a session booked by the biggest artist in the world so that I could get on a train and record a band in a tiny pub hundreds of miles away. Ken Townsend accompanied me on the trip, and I kept telling him that I was certain the Beatles would be ticked off that I wasn't there, especially since Malcolm Addy, of all people, was going to be taking my place. I was correct in my prediction, and I didn't hear the end of it for weeks. In fact, it's something that Paul still brings up occasionally, just to needle me. Given George Martin's reluctance to work with Malcolm, I have no idea why he was unable to pull strings to reverse management's decision. Perhaps it was just another sign that he was starting to lose control. The next evening, I was back at Abbey Road mixing the Magical Mystery Tour theme song. Malcolm had done a creditable job of recording the brass with the tape slowed down so that it would sound extra toppy when played back at normal speed. But once again, the four Beatles, Harrison in particular, did a lot of complaining about Malcolm's endless chatter. Richard described the session as having been a bit strained from start to finish with George Martin particularly on edge. Still, their performance was quite remarkable. The Beatles played and sang with tremendous confidence and the brass was note perfect with not a bluff to be heard, despite the intricacy of the part. During the mix, Richard added a lot of wobbly echo to the roll-up backing vocals and the piano signal was fed through a Leslie, making it quite a production. All in all, more than four days were spent on the track, and the care that went into it really shows. Mal and Neil said, Everyone joined in to sing the chorus, not just four Beatles, but everyone who happened to be around, including producer George Martin and actor Victor Spinetti, who dropped in for a chat. 
Oh. Uh, just letting you know that I can only listen from like three to seven seconds of music straight and it can't be too repetitive or I will get copyright stricken. I've explained this more in the description. This is not my choice. Don't want to hear complaints about it. <laughs> the brass in this song, it starts out with the brass right here. With these horns right here. This is such a fun song, honestly, like. The work on the vocals of the roll up and all of that was extensive and it makes me appreciate the effects that have gone into that. They made a point of making those roll ups sound kind of weird. I love that. I forgot about this bit. That's awesome. Such an interesting fade out here. This echoing bit, it's haunting, but I love that. This is anything but slopped together, haphazard or disappointing. It's very cool. I see why people would hear this and say, like, you put this one-to-one -to, -one to Sgt. Pepper, the song, and Magical Mystery Tour, the song. These are contenders. The Fool on the Hill. Paul says, I wandered off to France and did the Fool on the Hill part one morning with a couple of mates. It wasn't quite union. You were supposed to take millions of cameramen and we didn't want to do that. We knew we were bucking the system and making a far out silly little film and only occasionally did it get embarrassing. Most of the time we were able to say to people, look, this is very freewheeling, so just go down to the beach. We had Ivor Cutler. Let me see. Ivor Cutler. Who played Buster Blood Vessel. His romantic interest was Jesse. And we got him on the sand where he drew a big heart around her. We'd say that's nice and it would be part of the sequence. It did get a little hairy once or twice. I felt a bit sorry for people like Nat Jackley, whom we'd admired. He was an old music hall comedian who used to do eccentric dancing and funny walks. He was great at all of that and John and I really loved him. John wanted to do a sequence with him, but he got a bit annoyed because there wasn't enough script. Mal and Neil say a decidedly poly sort of ballad with him singing and playing piano. Ringo plays the finger cymbals. George and John use harmonicas and Paul double tracked his playing of the recorder to make it sound like two. The solo guitar passage is of course George. The only other instrument heard on The Fool on the Hill is a flute played by Paul. The Fool on the Hill. Now this is a sad song. Like everybody says it's a sad song. I think this song goes hard. So that's the way we're gonna be listening to it. Here it is. Bitch that's hard. That gets dark. Okay, and then it stops and you go back to like this very pretty bit. And we go back to another verse here. It goes hard, man. I wish I could show you guys what my brain is picturing right now. Just like this very mixture of... <sighs> Never mind. Shit goes hard. Love that. Love that bit right there. It's so fun. I see a lot of people on Twitter like saying that they cry. I do not find this song sad. I think it's so badass. Flying. Neil and Mal say, next on the agenda came the instrumental, Flying, which was started September 8th. John plays the main tune on his highly intelligent trained Mellotron and Paul and George play an assortment of guitars. The whole group got together to do the chanting bit late on the arrangement and in the end, electric sounds take over. John and Ringo build up these sounds in the studio and you can hear some of the recorded tape loops played backwards. Instrumentals. In instrumentals for me historically are harder to get through the copyright system, so I'm here. Just so we can listen to a little bit of the song because I usually don't have much to say about instrumentals and for that I'm sorry. But I know you guys want to hear some of the song. And I want to show you some of it too. So. Cough drop time. Copyright doesn't apply to cough drop time. 
Blue Jay Way. Mel and Neil say, in date order, the next track was George's Blue Jay Way, which started on September 6th. All the way through, you hear two Harrison voices. He recorded the second one on top of the first to pet the duet effect. Later, he recorded the vocal backing with Paul. A technical process called phasing was used on the vocal sounds and on George's Hammond organ playing to create that fascinating swirling effect. The only additional instrument heard here is a single cello, but there are studio built technical effects used on the very end of this record. Oh, there's another book I forgot to introduce. George Harrison, Behind the Locked Door by Graham Thompson. Graham. Graham, pretty straightforward once you know. This song is more example of his difficulties in transcending the specific moment, the specifics of the moment that inspired him to write. Blue Jay Way is about waiting and being bored and Lord doesn't sound like it. It did at least encapsulate accurately his overall feelings about a project he cared little for. I had no idea what was happening and maybe I didn't pay enough attention because my problem basically was that I was in another world, said Harrison. I didn't belong, I was just an appendage. On Blue Jay Way, he seems barely there at all. Once again, I seriously think this is just because of hindsight. This is the coolest sounding song. I love this song so much. This song sounds like it could have come out a month ago. Why doesn't everybody love the song? I hear shit about the, I don't understand. It doesn't make sense to talk shit about the song. It's too good. Percussion, George's voice, the echoes, the dude, good song. The strings here are like a really cool addition. <laughs> Fucking love it so much. So this song continues on this, please don't be long, please don't you be very long for the rest of the fade out. And I think something that the Beatles are all really good at, especially you can see it in this song, is having a repetitive out, but never having it become boring. They always add enough layer enough. It is not the same chorus over and over again. There's always something and we're seeing it right here. Your mother should know. Peter Asher says, Your mother should know, of course, is also from Magical Mystery Tour, the EP and the film. That is one of the only musicals I think we saw the Beatles do choreographed dance moves as they came down the stairs in those fabulous white suits. They had tie and tails from top to toe. Pretty amazing look and they had their dance steps totally right. I think Paul wrote that song on the harmonium that he kept in his house at Cavendish Avenue. The harmonium is an instrument of which Paul and I are both very fond and we both have used it on records. It is a small organ with a regular keyboard and free read for every note act activated by air pumped through the reeds by foot pedals which operate the bellows. I was always impressed when I noticed the pedals on my old harmonium were labeled patented mouse proof pedals. Apparently mice like to crawl in and eat holes in the paper bellows. The sound created by the reeds can be altered using various stops which physically diverse, diminish or open up the sound. A beautiful and delicate instrument and I know Paul used the harmonium on your mother should know. You can hear it. A reassuring and jolly song. Paul says, one of the reasons Auntie Jen auntie, auntie, whatever, Jen, came down to visit me in London when I was about 24 or 25 was to talk to me about the sin of smoking pot. Her nickname was Control and she had been sent down by family as an emissary. I suppose the word had got back that our Paul was going a little bit wild in London. So someone needed to go and check in on him. Anyway, she came down to visit me in Cavendish Avenue where I'd been living for a while. When your auntie comes to visit, you do some of the things you did when you were younger. So I was sitting around playing a bit of piano, having a drink, playing cards and having a good old chat. It was a very warm afternoon atmosphere and the song arose out of the sense of family. The well-known phrase that ghosts the song is mother knows best and many of our fans would have been beginning to think that their parents were just a bunch of old fuddy-duddies who had no idea about anything. In fact some of those parents might have harbored quite a strong feeling that the Beatles were dangerous that that didn't really bother us much because we knew we weren't and the bulk of our work was very optimistic and very well-intentioned which is true. Your mother should know it definitely falls into that category. It's a very simple thought really that could have translated easily into sort of ragtime song that was popular in my parents era. No one thought it at the time but we were really big fans of the music that came out of our parents generation. We 
recognize the impact of the memorable melodies in the structure of so many songs. Something about the structure, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight, verse, chorus, allowed those songs to last. Nowadays, I joke with folks when we're in a club or a restaurant or a gym and we're listening to a monotonous thud that goes on four or five minutes. I always imagine a classic songwriter like Cole Porter who often wrote in that verse, chorus, middle eight structure, coming back and listening to this music. He likely wouldn't recognize it as anything other than a beat to set some real music to. I know I'm running the risk of sounding like the very people who described the Beatles as rubbish and said that our stuff would never last. I remember my dad saying that his dad had complained about his music, which was Chicago jazz, Jelly Roll Morton and Louis Armstrong was Tin Can music. But it all comes back to what was popular at the time and I suppose the word hit resonates. We were, after all, in the business of writing hits for the Beatles. Actually, I'm in the same business today. I don't see any problem with trying to write hits. You can look at the word hit in two ways, either as a crass commercialism or trying to reach people. We knew that we made a song a hit before your mother was born was precisely what would make a hit now and in the future. I say precisely because it's an intangible quality that pulls us all together. It's what makes a worldwide community of listeners. <laughs> Love it. Already so happy. Your mother should know. I wonder if they have any bittersweet feelings about this song because it was the last song that Brian heard them play. It makes me sad, you know? I like John and those harmonies right there. Kind of goes hard. And all this just for the sin of smoking pot. I am the walrus. Just as little fun facty fact, I am the walrus had his only contemporary airing on BBC Radio when DJ Kenny Everett played it during a November 25th interview with John. Because it includes the very scandalous word, knickers. John says, every bloody record I put out was banned by the BBC for some reason or another. Even walrus was banned on the BBC at one time because it said knickers. We chose the word because it is a lovely expressive word. It rolls off the tongue. Somebody heard Joyce Grenfell talking yesterday about pull your knickers down. So listen, Sir Henry Fielding or whoever it is running the BBC. It's from the walrus and the carpenter, Alice in Wonderland. To me, it was a beautiful poem. It never dawned on me that Lewis Carroll was commenting on the capitalist system. I never went into that about what he really meant, like people were doing with the bear were. Later, I looked back and realized that the walrus was the bad guy in the story and the carpenter was the good guy. I thought, oh shit, I've picked the wrong guy, but that wouldn't have been the same, would it? I am the carpenter. We saw the movie in LA and the walrus was a big capitalist and he ate all the fucking oysters. I always had the image of the walrus in the garden and I loved it and I didn't ever check what the walrus was. He's a fucking bastard. That's what he turns out to be. But the way it's written, everybody presumes it means something. I mean, even I did. We all just presumed that because I said I am the walrus that it must mean I am God or something. It's just poetry. But it it became symbolic of me. Walrus is just saying a dream. The words don't mean a lot. People draw so many conclusions and it's ridiculous. I've had tongue in cheek all along. All of them had tongue in cheek. Just because other people see depths of whatever in it, what does it really mean? I'm the egg man. It could have been the pudding basin for all I care. It's not that serious. I'd seen some other people who like Dylan and Jesus going on about Hare Krishna. It was Ginsburg in particular I was referring to. The words elementary penguin was meant that it's naive to just go around chanting Hare Krishna or just putting your faith in one idol. In those days, I I was writing obscurely a la Dylan, never saying what you mean, but giving the impression of something where more or less can be read into it. It's a good game. I thought they get away with this arsy fartsy crap. There's been more said about Dylan's wonderful lyrics than was ever said in lyrics at all. Mine too, but it was the intellectuals who read all this into Dylan or the Beatles. Dylan got away with murder. I thought I can write this crap too. You just stick a few images together, thread them together and you call it poetry. I was just using the mind that I wrote in his right to write that song. There was even some live BBC radio. They were reciting Shakespeare or something and I just fed whatever lines were on the radio right into the song. Do you know what they're saying at the end there? Everybody's got one. Everybody's got one. We did about half a dozen mixes and I just used whatever was coming through at the time. I never really knew it was King Lear until years later somebody told me because I could hardly make out what he was saying. It was interesting to mix the whole thing with a live radio coming through it. So that's the secret of that one. Tony Bramwell says, when we listened to the playback, there was a sense of excitement that this was different, that this was new. There was none of the feeling that it was too weird for words. <laughs> It starts out so beautifully. Okay, the shit that George Martin said that this wouldn't be like an outstanding song on Sgt. Pepper. I guess he hasn't listened to Sgt. Pepper recently or he hasn't listened to this song recently. 
No shade to Sgt. Pepper, but it is not my favorite Beatles album. Vibe. This song is really groovy. Like, I, it's really groovy. I have a hard time pausing. <laughs> Such a dirty, dirty word. That's pretty cool. The radio bits right there. That is pretty cool. It sounds so creepy like that. I really like it. I think that's really neat. It almost sounds like an alien abduction, you know? Hello Goodbye. And Hello Goodbye is the reason why my Beatlemania started. Mal and Neil say, on October 2nd, it was time to get going on Hello Goodbye. Work on this recording was spread over quite a few weeks because all the four boys were busy editing and doing other jobs connected with the magical mystery tour film. You already know that Paul is the lead singer on Hello Goodbye, with George joining him and John to supply the answering voices. Those spiky metallic bed chords are played by John and George. Session men added the sound of two violas. Paul is on the piano and extra percussion rhythm them instruments like bongos and conga drums were brought in toward the end for the Maori final. Incidentally, sessions were delayed a couple of days in October when Paul got a swollen face caused by a hole in one of his teeth, but he's okay now. I really like this song. This song is so great. <laughs> This song is very different from a lot of the Magical Mystery Tour songs. Like we're already done with the Magical Mystery Tour songs now, but this with all the brass in it still fits with the Magical Mystery Tour songs. I always really loved the harmonies here. Love how angry George looks during the music video of this, but I also like how you can hear him during this bit. One of my favorite musical switch ups here. And just copyright break, copyright break. I also love how confused John looks in that music video. Sorry, we need to stop here and have a chat right now. I waffled on whether or not I should include the song background on the rest of these songs, specifically Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane, because I'd always planned on making a singular video on Strawberry Fields Forever. But then I was like, I said I'd do everything, right? So I went kind of hard, and then I realized that the Strawberry Field script by itself was actually over four pages, <laughs> and the background for Penny Lane would actually be better suited for that video, and Baby, You're a Rich Man background is better suited for a Yellow Submarine video. Baby, I already did a whole video on All You Need Is love. It's probably the best or second best video I've ever made, so you should go watch that. Essentially, all of this information, different video. Strawberry Fields Forever, which is one of my favorite songs. <laughs> Hi, it's me from a few minutes in advance. I'm just going to place these here for little bits because I was, I didn't say much during Strawberry Fields. <laughs> I love this song so much. It gets so powerful. John's voice sounds amazing the way that they did it. All of the effects. I Like I said, I had a long script on this song. Um, it's just so good. Paul is literally in a tree. <laughs> And while I didn't full out cry, I did get emotional. My policy here is to always show when I'm a cry baby back bitch. So I do have sneaking suspicions that I will cry when we listen to All You Need Is Love because I have an emotional attachment to that song. Penny Lane. Can I be real with y'all? This is the most overrated Paul song. <laughs> I'm sorry. It is. I don't think it's that good. <laughs> like, I just, I'm like, there are so many. Why are we talking about this one? I'm sorry. Not a bad song. Let's remember the grading rubric. As usual, your B is another person's A. Uh <laughs> it's a good song. It's just not, it's not as good as people say it is. Those goofy harmonies in the brass right there. Dun, 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 dun. Definitely make it a magical mystery tour song, but still, I'm just not that impressed with this song. 
Just wait until I do a video on it and I'll love it again. That's always how it happens. Baby, you're a rich man. <laughs> Percussion wise starts so strong. <laughs> Such a cool song, man. I wish I could hear John a little bit better. So I know that this song has been commercialized a lot. So people find it annoying now. I don't hear it that much, so I still really like it. Uh, it does not fit with the Magical Mystery Tour album at all. I just still wish we could hear him better here. All you need is love. I've done a video on this. I love this song so much. Sorry, I'm suddenly thinking of this one comment from someone that was like, you should have specified like something that was so fucking picky. And I was just like, are you kidding me? Oh. He was so nervous. John was so nervous. His voice was cracking right before. He was like chugging milk and George Martin was like, dude, stop, it's gonna make it worse. And he was like, I can't sing, my voice is gone. I do have sneaking suspicions that I will cry when we listen to All You Need Is Love because I have an emotional attachment to that song. Attachment to that song. This is my favorite part of the song. When they bring in a different part of the chorus and they speed it up, it gets a little chaotic. All right. Oh, that's very good. Thank you, John. That's fine. I think that will do for the vocal backing. Very nice. The Glenn Miller bit is very fun. That is John singing. Now, there have been comments like all over the place that are like, that's Paul singing. No, it's not. You can actually see John singing it in the video. Also, it sounds like John. Also, we have this bit of his voice cracking. All you need is love. The movie. Let's talk about the movie. <laughs> so the origin story, like I mentioned before, the Beatles had a three film contract with United Artists. The boys had worked with professional filmmakers on A Hard Day's Night and Help, and that was obviously not the plan this time. Paul came up with the idea for the film and they recorded the song and they had it in the can held off for a bit while they were busy taking over the world with Sgt. Pepper. No big deal. The movie's plot is based on mysterious things happening to the coach caused by these beetle slash mal magicians. <laughs> the movie focuses mostly on designated bug actor Bringo and his recently widowed aunt. They argue throughout the tour and Jesse catches feelings for another passenger. And with no better way to phrase it, calamity ensues. The cast stars Auntie Jesse, which Jesse Robbins, the tour director Jolly Jimmy Johnson, played by Derek Royal, the tour hostess Miss Wendy Winters, played by Miranda Forbes, credited as Mandy Wheat, the conductor Busser Blood Vessel, played by Ivor Cutler, and the Beatles. John says, at the beginning of 1967, we realized that we wouldn't be doing any more concert tours because we couldn't reproduce on stage the type of music we'd started to record. So if stage shows were to be out, we wanted something to replace them. Television was the obvious answer. George says, for years, we looked around for a screenplay that was suitable, but in the time that had elapsed since A Hard Day's Night and Help, although it was probably only two years, it was as if we'd gone through 500 years mentally. That is so true. We didn't see any way of making a similar film of four jolly lads nipping around singing catchy little tunes. It had to be something that had more meaning. I remember we had Patrick McGowan around and he'd written a couple of episodes of a series called The Prisoner, which we liked very much. We thought, well, maybe he could write something for us. And then there was David Hellowell who wrote Little Malcolm and his struggles against the eunuchs. We got him up and asked him to write us something. I know there was also a Joe Orton project, but I don't have any recollection of anybody meeting Joe Orton or ever seeing the screenplay, although it did come out later. I think that was probably a Brian Epstein kind of trip. Now this is actually out of order and it's a quote from Magical Mystery Tours, the movie, 
editor, Roy Benson, but it's a similarity to what we're talking about here that I'd like to add. And I told you I'd tell you everything. So Roy Benson says, some months later, I received a call on a Friday evening from the Apple office asking me to go over to Abbey Road as Paul wanted to talk with me. When I arrived, all the Beatles were there putting down tracks for their next album. I sat down with Paul in a corner and he explained that they wanted to shoot a promo for Hey Jude. I had heard the song some weeks earlier and was really knocked out by it. Paul said that they would like me to direct it and they wanted to shoot it in a day. Knowing that the song was seven minutes long, I said it would require two days to shoot that amount of screen time. The idea was to shoot the Beatles in a prison background. This was the only spec I was given. So Paul gave me a copy of the song and I went to work over the weekend on a specifically timed script with a shot by shot breakdown of the lyric, working on visually exciting images to make this a very unusual film. I wrote the sequence centering on each of the Beatles' lifestyle, taking them through to old age to fade out on each of them in a rocking chair, all wearing John Lennon glasses. I had already started pre-production on the Monday and was in the Apple office with my producer when Peter Brown came out to inform us that they decided to shoot the promo on tape instead of film and would be included in the David Frost shows. I argued, is there anything I can do to change their mind? But alas, no. They have never seen the script I wrote and I personally feel they missed a great opportunity to make a film that they could look back on in time and have something very special of their era. That would have been pretty dope, but it wasn't planned. It was Paul's. Now, Paul said, I'm not sure whose idea Magical Mystery Tour was. Paul has also said that it was his idea, okay? This was in the anthology book. So this was later in the early mid-1990s. So don't get all commenty about it. He said that he's taken credit since, okay? I'm not sure whose idea Magical Mystery Tour was. It could have been mine, but I'm not sure whether I want to take the blame for it. We were all in on it, but a lot of the material at that time could have been my idea because I was coming up with a lot of concepts like Sgt. Pepper. I'm not saying that was my album. Obviously, we all worked on it, but I was coming up with a lot of ideas. Privately, I'd got a camera and would go out to the park and make films. We'd show our little home movies to each other and we'd put crazy soundtracks on them. I used to do a bit of editing at home and I had a little machine and I was getting very into it. So for the next Beatles project, I thought, let's go and make a film. What a great thing to do. It was all done on whims. There wasn't a script for Magical Mystery Tour. Don't need scripts for that kind of film. It was just a mad idea. We said to everyone, be on the coach Monday morning. I told them all, we're just going to make it up as we go along, but don't worry, it'll be all right. I did have to keep chatting to people because the security of a script is obviously very helpful, but we knew we weren't going to do a regular film. We were going to do a crazy roly-poly 60s film with I am the Eggman and so on. While Paul did what he does when faced with death, ignore it in work, John was grappling with the loss of Brian. They were back in the studio just the next week. John says, I was still under a false impression. I still felt every now and then that Brian would come in and say, it's time to record or time to do this. And Paul started doing that. Now we're going to make a movie. Now we're going to make a record. And he assumed that if he didn't call us, nobody would ever make a record. Paul would say, well, now we felt like it. And suddenly I'd have to whip out 20 songs. He'd come in with about 20 good songs and say, we're recording, and suddenly I'd have to write a fucking stack of songs. Despite John's complaints, he did have something to do Magical Mystery Tour Circle. Neil says, Paul and John sat down in Paul's place in St. John's Wood. They drew a circle and then marked it off like the spokes on a wheel. It was a case of, we can have a song here and a dream sequence here and so on. They mapped it out. Now, the circle made it into the recording studio even. Jeff Emmerich's recollection is more of a, this was Paul's circle, not John and Paul's circle. Jeff says, at one point he came into the studio excitedly waving a drawing of a big circle that he had divided up like a pie, showing the various scenes that he had in mind, handing out instructions to the others. It made no sense whatsoever to me, and it seemed equally incomprehensible to John, George, and Ringo, but everyone nodded bemusedly. That being said, John obviously had a hand in it. He says, we knew most of the scenes we wanted to include, but we bent our ideas to fit the people concerned. And once we got to know our cast, if somebody wanted to do something we hadn't planned, they went ahead. If it worked, we kept it in. There was a lovely little five-year-old girl, Nicola, on the bus. And because she was there and because we realized that she was right for it, we put in a bit where I just chat to her and give her a balloon. And we'll hear from her in a bit. Before we go on, I have a confession. I'm fat. I know, I'm so sorry that you had to find out like this. I really am. Why does that matter? It doesn't, but because we have several mentions of fat ladies and little people, they use a different word, but little people, coming up, I figured I would get some sort of comment Hmm, (laughs) I'm positive I would hear it somewhere. I literally don't care. I call myself fat. It's my body. I'm not offended by it. I'm not offended by jokes made in the 60s because if we're going to make comparisons from the Beatles time with the lens in awareness of 2023, you will never ever be anything but disappointed and heartbroken, okay? That being said, 
just a reality here. Whenever I get weight shaming or fat phobic comments, they get deleted. You can come up with a better criticism of me than to talk about my appearance. I think I look pretty fucking awesome. And if you have a problem with that, that's on you, man, not me. I'm so sorry that it's so difficult. <laughs> Going off script just a little bit because I forgot to include some of the, because it didn't get quite included the way I want it to be. So just gonna read from this fucking massive book. I mean, I don't care that this is annoying for you sonically. This is annoying for me physically. <laughs> God. Ringo says, Magical Mystery Tour was Paul's idea. It was a good way to work. Paul had a great piece of paper, just a blank piece of white paper with a circle on it. The plan was, we start here and we've got to do something here, and we filled it in as we went along. We rented a bus and off we went. There was some planning. John would always want a little person or two around, and we had to get on an aircraft hangar to put the set in. We do the music, of course. They were the finest videos, and it was a lot of fun. To get the actors, we looked through the actor's directory spotlight. Oh, we need someone like this, and someone like that and we needed a large lady to play my auntie so we found a large lady. George says, it was basically a Charabanc trip, which people used to go on from Liverpool to see the Blackpool lights. They'd get a load of crates and beer and all get pissed in the English sense. It was very flimsy and we had no idea what we were doing. At least I didn't. I had no idea what was happening and maybe I didn't pay enough attention because my problem basically was that I was in another world. This is where Paul felt somebody had to try to do something. So he decided he'd push what he felt. As for me, I didn't really belong. I was just an appendage. There were a number of people whose help we called upon. Dennis O'Dell was one. I think he'd been an associate producer on A Hard Day's Night, and later he was brought in to have something to do with Apple. We were in need of having a grown-up person, a father figure, in the business side of film. In one respect, Magical Mystery Tour was probably quite good, because it got us doing something. It got us out and got us together. I did have a bit on Dennis O'Dell. It turns out... <laughs> <laughs> that this movie might have sent this man into an early grave. Like, I don't know if he died in, died, I don't know. It kind of sounds like this man felt that this film was going to send him into an early grave. A lot of conversation, I think from Tony, Tony Bramwell. Yeah, Tony Bramwell's book talked about it quite a bit, but I wound up cutting it out because it would have been quite a bit of extra information. Paul was inspired by a lot of things, like we mentioned those Blackpool trips, but also comedic elements in the popular press and media. He was heavily inspired by Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters Search for a Cool Place. And if you're like me and had no idea what the Merry Pranksters are, here's a snippet from their Wikipedia page. The Merry Pranksters were comrades and followers of American author Ken Kesey. Kesey and the Merry Pranksters lived communally at Kesey's homes in California and Oregon and are noted for the sociological significance of a lengthy road trip they took in the summer of 1964, traveling across the United States in a psychedelic painted school bus called Further, organizing parties and giving out LSD. They filmed every encounter on this trip, but the film was never released. And here's Barry Miles on this. Did I mention Barry Miles? He's another Beatles author. Anyway, he says, in 1964, Kesey and his cohorts painted a 1939 International Harvester school bus in psychedelic colors and had taken it on a transcontinental tour of the USA, dispensing LSD along the way and filming and recording every dramatic encounter, intending to make a movie called The Merry Prankster's Search for a Cool Place. The film never materialized, but the bus trip became the stuff of legend, eventually being written up by Tom Wolfe in the electric Kool-Aid acid test. Jeff talks about Paul bringing that casting book from a film agent agency he'd brought to the studio. Everyone gathered around picking the cast, searching for familiar faces for the most part. Jeff says, everyone had great fun looking through the book, shouting as they'd flip through the pages. Look at him, look at her. They were particularly amused by the photos of the fat lady who ended up playing Ringo's Aunt Jessie. She's four times the size of you, Ring, Lennon chortled with glee. One of the odder people they selected, mostly at John's urging, was someone I knew slightly, Ivor Cutler, a member of the Mast Alberts. He was a poet, a petite man dressed in all black who played a lap top harmonium, accompanying himself as he half sang, half recited his silly little couplets. Plain and simple, the guy was nuts, so naturally he was chosen. By the way, in between this, there was a free speech benefit at the Alexander Palace in Crouch End, and Jeff attended. There were rumors that the Beatles were going to show up and play some of their new materials, and you can imagine the kind of excitement was surrounding these rumors, but John was the only one who showed up, stoned with a couple of his friends. No matter how much they worked on that little circle, the script never materialized, and I loved everyone's perspective 
on the ad lib script. Tony Barrow says, perhaps the most remarkable aspect of this whole ill-prepared project was the absence of any shooting script. Paul distributed sheets of paper on which he had put some outline ideas for gags and sketches, which might become the basis of film scenes. In each case, he had nominated a different Beatle to look after the idea and expand it. Giving one to John, he said something like, add to it, you know, make more of it if you can. Write some pieces of dialogue, a few jokes, fill it out whatever way you like. Change it all together if you've got a better idea. It's all yours. John was willing to enter into the spontaneity of the occasion, but confess to me, writing film lines is nothing like composing song lyrics. John continued, I'm not even sure what you need for a script like this. Is this just for us or will the cameramen see it? I'll have to dig out help and look at that. Have you got a copy if I can't find mine? Paul visualized the film being a kind of day out we all remember from our childhood in Liverpool when our moms would see an ad in the window of the local news agent, a mystery coach trip. They were cheap days out to stop us kids from getting bored during the long summer holidays. We nearly always ended up at Blackpool, the traditional traditional northern seaside resort with its piers, its brightly lit fairgrounds, and miles of sandy beaches. It's a whole bunch of people, fat ones, thin ones, little ones, mad ones, like you get in real life. It's what they do, what they talk about, the fun they have, their eccentricities. You can't script it. It happens. Paul explained, it frustrated when the actors ask, where's the script? When somebody else complained we were behind schedule, I said, no, we're not. We don't have a schedule. The entire film is one big ad lib. John says, Paul said, well, here's the segment. You write a piece for that. And I thought, fucking Ada, I never made a film. What does he mean, write a script? So I ran off and wrote the whole dream sequence for that fat woman and all the things with spaghetti and all that. And here's another quote from John. We haven't got a script yet, but we've got a bloke going around the lavatories of Britain, cribbing all the notes off the wall. Filming preparation. Well, off the wall is right. Here's Tony Barrow's conversation about film preparations. And well, Tony says, I stay behind to mind the shop and prepare for the sequences to be filmed in Raymond's review bar, Soho Strip Club. I had approached the owner, Paul Raymond, when the Beatles suggested the scenes and he was thrilled to help. He had one provisio. Proviso. Proviso. Sure. We must film early in order that we did not disrupt his regular trade. That seemed fair, but there is early and there is early. We began Monday, 18 September at 6 a.m. That is early. We had problems almost immediately when two representatives of the Cinema Trades Union arrived and threatened to close us down unless we employed the correct number of staff. The whole idea of the project was to operate with a minimum crew, but these jokers were about to saddle us with 32 technician and ancillary staff. We never saw most of them, but the rules and regulations stipulated 32 staff and we had to employ 32 staff if we wanted to finish the film. It was ridiculous. My outstanding memory of the making of Magical Mystery Tour is the sequence featuring Your Mother Should Know. The scene was Paul's tribute to the American choreographer, film director, Busby Berkeley and it was filmed in a ballroom, which was constructed in a huge aircraft hangar at West Mailing Air Base. West Mailing Air Base. West Mailing. Sure. A sweep staircase dominated the set and the Beatles rehearsed their entrances on it before disappearing to get changed. Paul was looking for my support and gaining the confidence of the others for, for what was essentially a Paul McCartney project. He hoped to establish his personal reputation as a filmmaker, the Beatles filmmaker, by handling all aspects of Magical Mystery Tour without hiring outsiders to organize things. He saw this as a prelude to a promising new era in the group's career which might otherwise be coming to a premature end. It was a crazy scheme but a fabulous challenge. Experienced film industry professionals would take months to set up the elaborate production schedule for a feature such as this, but Paul wanted us to do it ourselves in a matter of days. He showed me a rough drawing he had done in the shape of a big round clock face, marked into eight or ten time segments, adding up to 60 minutes, each representing a film sequence, some totally blank with a few suggested songs, others simply saying stuff like people get on coach, magicians in their lab, and strip club Soho, microphone system and coach driver, courier hostess by uniforms after coach Shepperton Studios one week. The sheer enormity of the tasks that lay ahead did not daunt the Beatles. They delegated bits and pieces to those they trusted, ignoring the major fault in the scheme. Few of us had the slightest professional experience in film production. For me, the most bizarre moments were the two days I spent auditioning a room full of strippers from Raymond's Review Bar in Soho while John and George ogled them strictly in the cause of art. Ladies be looking good. I, I, I get it, you know? Paul Raymond, the emperor of strip clubs, join in enthusiastically, lining up his best girls, being as helpful as possible. He grew so wealthy, he bought the Windmill Theater, famous for never closing during the war. It had always seemed the height of sophistication and sinfulness, the kind of place where sleek men with pencil mustaches and dinner jackets went for fun. They matched the camp style of Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. This is literally such a tongue twister. Bonzo Dog Doodah Band? 
Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. That Paul hired to play the filmed strip tease session. The band, founded by Vivian Stanshell and Rodney Slater, two Royal College of Arts students, was originally named Bonzo Dog Dada Band after a cute 1920s postcard puppy in Dadaism, the anti-art movement. Paul first saw the Bonzos at the Isle of Wight Pop Festival and was very taken with their mocking louche take on bands like the Temperance Seven. Like I said, they always like to hire inside the family. So they need a couple of girls and Tony Barrow goes to Frida Kelly, which is the president of the Beatles fan club. And he says, Hey, I need like you and three other girls, three other fan club girls. You want to help me out? Are you interested in coming on this trip? And she was like, boy, am I. Originally filming was supposed to be a three day coach tour beginning September 4th with hotels for two nights. A yellow coach was to be hired through September 9th, but filming didn't actually start until September 11th. The trip was filmed in Devon, Cornwall, and Paul filmed Fool on the Hill in Nice, for France. Additional scenes were shot at RAF West Malling, a decommissioned airfield in Kent. I'm going through the schedule a little bit here. I'm going to be reading from the girls' accounts of the filming, and the whole thing will be on screen if you want to pause and read, but I'm just going to read some of the highlights because I think that they're funny. On Monday, everybody is supposed to meet at Alsop Place at 10.45 a.m., but the coach was two hours late because it took a long time to decorate the bus. John, George, and Ringo met just down the street at Virginia Water, but Paul was there with Ivor Cutler and they were talking people up <laughs> and this is actually really funny. Frida says, Ivor came over to me on the pavement and said, I'm sure I've seen your skull before. That was certainly an offbeat introduction to S Scotsman Ivor Cutler, the effabeat comedian who turned out to be one of the artists engaged in part of the show. Well, we were all there, but the bus wasn't. It was being decorated with colorful mystery tour signs. So with Paul and the rest of the cast, we filled in our spare hour by drinking tea in a London transport stall canteen and the hospitality was very welcome. Tony Bramwell said, the Beatles and a huge crowd of actors, technicians, journalists, and camp followers disappeared around the country in the mystery bus like an army on the move. The bus was nothing special, just a yellow and blue one from a bus company and definitely not luxurious. Nothing special was done to it other than having bright flyers printed to be stuck on the sides. These were almost immediately ripped off by fans and Mal spent most of his time pasting on new ones. When it was realized how visible the bus was, drawing hundreds of fans and getting streams of people following in its wake in dozens of cars, a situation that worried the police, the flyers were removed and not replaced. Not that it made any difference. By then, the bus was so famous that people recognized it wherever it went. Around this time, I can remember raising the question of security and crowd control. How could we expect to take the world's best-known pop band on the road from London to Devon to Cornwall in a brightly painted tour bus without attracting the attention of press and fans on a grand scale? Paul didn't even pause for thought. He'll be with us on the bus to look after the press and we'll invite the fan club secretaries who can control their own members if the situation gets out of hand. Other than the group's regular roadies and drivers. We didn't use extra minders or heavies or bouncers to protect the boys. Ginny Crowley says, the boys take the back of the bus to change. The buttons had come off John's trousers and Ginny jokingly offered to sew them and he took her up on it. It would have been easier if he weren't wearing the trousers at the time. She had to use white cotton to sew brown trousers. And Frida said, we stopped at a restaurant called the Pied Piper for lunch. The Beatles got their meals in no time, the staff being overwhelmed to find such distinguished customers arriving unexpectedly. I sat at the table with Sylvia, Jenny, and Barbara, the girls from the fan club, and we still hadn't put in our orders. George looked over and asked why we were still waiting. Then he went straight to the kitchen and emerged again a moment later with my lunch. The others are coming right away, he told the girls. On Tuesday, the bus pulled up to an unprepared Bernie Grand Hotel in Plymouth for lunch. Sylvia Nightingale says that there were 20 people in a caravan with crew, press, and photographers. I had decided to wear hippie gear for the trip, and the Beatles constantly reminded me of the fact. By the way, they had to wear the same outfit every single day for continuity's sake. They so delicately referred to me as a zippy hippie and Miss Freak Out. As I was eating lunch to the jingle of my bells, John turned to me and said, you younger generation with all your bells. At a little place called Bodman, everybody tucked into ice cream and lolly while a bit of roadside filming was done. I was was given an orange ice lolly and Ringo was sucking a red one. Do you want to swap? He said, it's quite clean. I've looked it all over for you boys. And Jenny says, they tried to pass a bridge that was too narrow for their coach, but they couldn't and had to turn back through a traffic jam they'd caused. And George spent the rest of the night talking to her about meditation on the whole bus trip. <laughs> so Wednesday comes and this was the day that they were supposed to leave, but the weather stopped them. So they made the best of a situation by filming a swimming pool scene with Nat Jackley. This required girls in bikinis. So, so they had some of the fan club girls and some locals join in. The girls froze, shivered up against a concrete wall, searching for any semblance of relief while John directed the scene in a well-insulated jacket. Wikipedia said that the Beatles spent three days filming the scene. 
No. It was one afternoon. I don't know where the hell they came up with that. They were delayed two extra days. They were supposed to be done filming on Wednesday, but weather had delayed them. They were supposed to film in this big field and they had to delay that for Thursday and Friday. They spent the rest of the week at the hotel. This was only a one afternoon scene. I don't know why. Yeah. The bikini scene was mostly cut. I haven't really found a reason for this, except for I just assume that BBC, etc., said that it was too risque. We've got a couple photos and this one shot of a woman in the intro. Another assumption includes the fact that Nat Jackley was in the scene and he was unhappy with the lack of script. He was the rubber man and seen in certain scenes and Paul said that they chose him mostly for his funny walks. Later, they found billiard tables at their hotel and Ringo ad-libbed a scene. Ginny Crowley said, Ringo was good at billiards, but Paul insisted he had a bad cue, although he tried everyone available. <laughs> Sylvia Nightingale says, on the bus, I pointed out to Ringo that his trousers were splitting. What is wrong with these boys and their shitty, shitty pants? In an embarrassing place. Can you sew them up for me? He said, to my surprise. I did so, to the astonishment of fans peering through the coach windows. Is that okay? I asked when the job was done. Fine, said Ringo, as he staggered off the coach. <laughs> Fine, said Ringo, as he staggered off down the coach, bent double. And Frida says, We were all filmed during lunch one day. Apparently, the Beatles had been in the ballroom the night before, having a drink and got to chatting to this band leader chap. Paul asked him what he was doing for lunch the next day, and he said, Nothing. He was recruited to play while we ate. And let's hear from Spencer Davis, because he ran into them. The Spencer Davis group had just filmed a tour, and I was having a holiday staying with my wife and daughters at the pub, which was owned by the parents of our roadie, Alec Leslie. I knew the Beatles quite well, so when I heard that they were filming... At the Atlantic Hotel in New Quay, I called up and asked Mal Evans what was going on. Mal immediately invited me over, so the whole family got into the Mini and drove over there. Paul seemed to be directing the film and, to my amazement, one of the film crew turned out to be John Mayle's wife, Pamela. We were immediately roped in to do a bit of filming, and you can see us in a group shot at the back of the bus, which also appears on the back cover of the album. While we were chatting during the day, I invited Paul back to the pub for a drink. So that night, I'm sitting in the bar where the punters in the pub just couldn't believe it. Paul, being the sort of character he is just grins at everybody, shouts evening all, and then installs himself at the piano where he began belting out pub songs all evening and everybody just singing along until about two in the morning. That was such a great night. Thursday, they film in the field. Okay, hundreds of holiday makers joined and the police were called to back them off. Ginny Crowley says, in this scene, John, Paul, Sylvia, and I had to crouch in a small tent. It was difficult enough keeping my balance without having to swat wasps and avoid sitting on beetles. The bug kind. Paul kept telling us to keep very still and the wasps would go away. One did, but not until it had crawled all over Paul's motionless mouth. This evening, after getting a refreshing wash, Sylvia, Paul, Ringo, and yours truly, and a few others took Spencer Davis up on his invitation to come over to the little pub he was staying in and have a bit of a party. We didn't get back until three in the morning. The tour had had a rare quality of magic and fantasy about it, but everything on earth comes to an end and we had to accept that. Friday, the week wraps up and here's what Jenny has to say about it. George and I stood with John, sharing his cheese and dipped it in tomato sauce, which may sound a bit off, but believe me, is very tasty. I believe you. That actually doesn't sound too bad. Traveling back towards London this evening, we sang song and carols while Shirley Evans played an accordion. Soon, too soon, it was all over. George, Ringo, and John got off first, but Paul stayed with us until the bus reached Baker Street. I hope you enjoy watching the film as much as we enjoyed helping make it. It was a fabulous week. Sylvia Nightingale said, I must admit I'd been very nervous about meeting the Beatles for the first time. Now I wonder how I could have been. They made us feel as though we belonged by chatting as if we were all old friends. I have realized for the first time how genuine and groovy they they are always cheerful, friendly, and full of jokes. I consider myself very lucky and wouldn't have missed it for anything. Well, would you? Barbara King also shared her story. She wrote about people being rude to the Beatles while they're trying to eat, almost getting left behind, but Paul making her feel better about it, and trying to convince the Beatles to sing their own music, but they refused. One of my favorite anecdotes from this entire trip is from Frida about Ringo. She says, I chatted for ages with Richie. We talked about everything from Mo's new baby, from the offer Richie had just received in order to appear with stars like Mark. Marlon Brando and Richard Burton in the Hollywood film Candy. The offer was a great secret at the time, but wasn't announced in the paper until weeks after. Richie was obviously very excited about the idea of making his solo film debut, and it was nice to be able to share his private pleasure. Incidentally, all through the week, Richie collected his empty Siggy packets, plus some from the other three lads, and gave them to me at the end of filming. This means that some of the thousand members who have been asking me for souvenirs of this sort will be getting what they want. I can't get everyone a packet, so I'll have to pick out names from a hat to decide who gets this particular bundle of souvenirs. Ringo says, it was a good shoot. It was a lot of fun. And again, we were making videos, making 
making little movies and it was going to save us going on the road, going around the TV shows and saying hello yet again to Kathy McGowan. John's poetry in those songs was so great. In one line, he could say what it takes most people in a whole song or novel to say with the same sharp bite. The songs were getting better, both melodically and musically. Frida says, it was a marvelous week, one I wouldn't have missed for anything. Just to make it even more marvelous, all the people on the tour were good friends by the end of the week. The professional actors and actresses mixed in with all of us amateur passengers and we had a great time. I can't wait to see the finished television film. I know it's going to be unlike anything I'd ever seen on telly and that the mystery tour show will be another feather in the Beatles caps. And here's some miscellaneous quotes and interviews because why not? So here's George via journalist Miranda Ward. We want everyone who watches to be able to freak out as it were, but we don't want to frighten them. Some people will get a bit frightened when the music suddenly goes strange, as in day in the life because they don't know what's happening. In this film, we don't want the viewer to be puzzled or scared. We will be able to freak them out a little bit. Our excuse will be that it's a magical mystery tour, so everyone will be calm. They expect anything to happen when magic is involved. The title song will be played over the beginning when all the party are boarding the coach. The other numbers will be incorporated into fantasy or dream sequences between the coach party scenes. The courier, say, will ask everybody to look to their left some old building or local landmark, then look to their right and they'll see that's where the material we shoot in the studios come in. George and I were sitting on the grass outside our hotel in New Quay, Cornwall, over cups of tea. The only place where I get good tea is at home, he commented as he poured. It's sad, really, because some of our staunchest fans are the ones who will never get to know us just because of the way they act. We are obviously not going to hang around when they are screaming, shouting, and trying to pull our clothes off. It's the quiet, shy ones we get a chance to chat to. He explained as he signed autographs and poured yet more cups of tea. Graham Thompson says, Harrison drifted through the experience, which was filmed partly in Devon and Cornwall and also in and around London. So we get it. <laughs> it was filmed in Devon and Cornwall. <laughs> His inscrutable expression as he sits at Paul Raymond's review bar watching a strip tease act makes his thoughts hard to discern, but it was certainly a long way from levitating yogis. At the sessions for the soundtrack EP, as McCartney worked on Sub Pepper title track, Harrison quote, got a set of crayons out of his painted sheepskin jacket and started to draw a picture. Ivor Cutler says, I don't think Ringo was very sure of me. He was a very easygoing kind of bloke, but I'm not much use in those kinds of situations. You either take me or leave me. George was similar, but less intense. He was very into the Maharishi at that time, and I'm no good at things like Zen. Paul seemed a very intelligent, shrewd man, and his mind was really keen, very much a seeker after information and very aware and alive, but always with a mind rather like a machine in some ways, busy synthesizing and correlating all the time. That's not a criticism. John was the one I found easiest to get along with. I suspect it was mutual. Victor Spinetti says, I'd worked with the Beatles in their previous movies, so John wrote to me and asked if I would be the courier in Magical Mystery Tour. I was busy doing a play, Oh What a Lovely War, in London, so I had to turn it down, and Ivor Cutler went on and did it marvelously. But John still wanted me to be involved, so he got to me to drive down to West Malling Aerodome for the day and do a little drill sergeant routine with Paul. It was something I did in the play anyway, and it was all improvised, so it was no problem. One lovely thing was that when we broke for lunch, they had set aside 20 minutes for anybody who wanted to meditate, which I did. It was a lovely calm moment in the middle of a schedule, and they were all into that since they'd been with the Maharishi. The filming was unusual in as much as it wasn't done in lots of short takes like a normal movie. They filmed long sequences and they improvised as they went along. At one point, John spotted a stuffed cow and he just decided there and then to have it in the shot. They were all making it up as they went along. Annabelle Pasco, the daughter of the proprietor of the Atlantic Hotel says, I was 16 at the time and my parents owned the Atlantic Hotel. They didn't tell me they were expecting the Beatles, so on my way home from school, I saw what looked like hundreds of these girls running around on the lawn and I couldn't understand it. The hotel was so full, the Beatles stayed in our annex, which is across the car park over a little bridge, which also gave them a little more privacy and allowed them each to have a room of their own. This wasn't long after Brian Epstein had died, and I remember they still had a lot of letters of condolence arriving every day. Most of them ended up in waste paper bins. The whole time they stayed, we had to have curtains on the ground floor drawn because otherwise there would be girls staring in through all the windows. At lunchtime the next day, we had a dinner party in the ballroom, which was filmed, and you can see the Beatles being served by our waiters on the inside cover of the Magical Mystery Tour EP. We had a little three-piece band with a violin, piano, and drums, and all of the four Beatles danced waltzes and foxtrots to their music with the hotel residents, most of whom would have been in their 50s. The Beatles were the biggest thing ever in those days, and I was incredibly excited, but I was also much too shy to go up to them, so in the end, my dad had to drag me over. I shook hands with Paul McCartney and he said, what are you grinning at? And I went bright red all over. They wore the same clothes for the whole time they were with us, which I suppose was for continuity in the film. But after they'd booked out, we found that Paul McCartney had left a pair of underpants in his 
his bed. Tony Barrow says, Stan Brown still remembers that day in September 1967. The former West Malling news agent then had his shop on the opposite side of High Street. It was a warm Saturday afternoon and he was serving behind the counter of the town news agency when the producer of the film called around asking if he could borrow the shop. He wanted to shoot a scene which required a booking office for tickets for the Magical Mystery Tour. I said no, I still had half hours business time left and it was only five o'clock and that they could use it after 5.30. Word of the Beatles visit had already spread around the town and by 5.30 p.m. crowds had gathered. The police were called in and the star's Rolls Royce pulled up. A camera was set up inside the shop and filmed Ringo Starr striding up the high street and into the shop. He looked around and then made for the counter where ticket salesman John Lennon was standing. A large brightly colored poster advertising the Magic mystery tour covered a cigarette dispenser just to the left of the till. Ringo bought his tickets and left. End of the scene, which was directed by Paul McCartney, Stan has fond memory of the experience and so has his daughter Penelope. Only seven then, she passed the time by playing with John Lennon's mustache, the fake one he put on while playing ticket salesman. That's so cute. Two days later, on the Monday, the actors and camera crews were at West Malling Airfield. Recollects Tim Balduck of Balduck's clothing stores West Malling. There were flower-painted cars and buses and long-haired hippies and caftans and sandals everywhere. The film crew wanted to shoot some crowd scenes and we were recruited for the job. They directed us into a hangar where lights and scenery filled the place. Then the four came down a flight of stairs, miming a song which was played over the loudspeakers. Paul McCartney was directing scenes and shouting orders all over the place. Yet another local who remembers the Beatles' visit is Peter Rimmer of Snodland. He was then just a junior reporter at a local newspaper. My attempt to interview George Harrison was brief and to the point, he recalls. George just looked at me and said, get a proper job. End of interview. <laughs> David Penny, a local schoolboy back then, played his part in the story of the mystery tour. I'm the boy who falls over a fallen flag chasing some ballroom dancers about two minutes into the film. My father was sent to Aden with the RAE, so my mother and myself were sent to this virtually deserted station where the Beatles arrived to complete the filming of Magical Mystery Tour. My mother was asked if she and a few other wives could help with the washing up in the catering vans. Within a day, she was feeding the fabs. Passengers Nicola Hale, known as Little Nicola in the film, and Dave Hale also shared their experiences. I have a vivid memory of fighting with Paul McCartney on the floor of the hotel and playing table football with Ringo Starr and John Lennon. I remember John asking my mother for sixpence. And Dave says, my mother-in-law expected everyone to be strange and weird, but the Beatles were always nice and polite. In the evenings, John or Paul played piano and led everyone to sing songs. John hadn't brought enough underpants for the week, and so Pam's mother bought him some. What is with these boys in their underpants? Nikki was more interested in the cameras than in the Beatles. As far as editing goes, the Beatles did hire an editor, like I mentioned earlier, Roy Benson, but they directed the editing themselves. It took more than six weeks, with mostly Paul with additions from Ringo, John, and George, but Ringo was helping because he had an interest in photography and cameras in general. Ringo was also accredited as the director of photography. Mal and Neil say, originally the Beatles reckoned it wouldn't take more than a week or so to edit all the film and make up a 60-minute program. That was me with Lost. We're coming up on two years in February. <laughs> in fact, the job took more than six weeks. Each day you'd find two or more Beatles busy in a tiny editing room in Old Compton Street, Soho. The work began around 10 in the morning and they very seldom knocked off before six or seven in the evening. Editing is something which could always have been left to other people, but the Beatles wanted to get everything exactly the way it should be and they know it was well worth spending all the time looking at strips of film and joining up all the scenes. All told, there must have been 20 or 30 hours of color film to plow through. Pete Shodden says, the Beatles subsequently devoted the better part of two months to editing the film in an upstairs Soho cutting room. Paul especially seemed convinced that Magical Mystery Tour would be acclaimed as yet another Beatles masterpiece. I found him in a particularly good mood when I dropped in one afternoon. He even called out to the window to an elderly drunk we heard singing in the street and invited him to join us. The drunk Dooley shambled upstairs bottle in hand to lead John, Paul, George, and Ringo through round after round of old drinking songs such as There's an Old Mill by the Stream. He seemed totally oblivious to the identity of his new friends, for all he knew or cared, the Beatles might have been an ordinary group of young scruffs from the local pub. Sorry your hair is forgettable, ma'am. Sorry my hair makes an impact. Sorry I make strong choices. Alan Clayson, Ringo biographer says, aesthetics aside, his growth as a photographer was blighted by technological naivety, but gleaning what he could from trial and error, he discovered words like field, gate, and aperture as applied to a camera, the versatility of delayed action shutters, and that there's a lot you can do with a negative. When in a newly created darkroom at Sunny Heights, he started developing and printing his own films. Here, at least, was an area in which he was an authority as far as McCartney, Harrison, and Lennon could see. And I had all these funny lenses, he said. Billed as its director of photography, he showed what these and the rest 
rest of his equipment could do in a lot of magical mystery tour, such as a scene where George and I put him in my living room and projected slides on him. It's nothing new. It was done back in 1926 or so, but I happen to be a camera buff and I think it came out fine. Second to Paul, Ringo was the Beatle most active in magical mystery tours editing processes when it came to the cramped Soho cutting room while tossing morsels into a slavering process over scampi and chips washed down with a hawk in an adjacent restaurant. Roy Benson said, my initial contact with the Beatles came through Dennis O'Dell, who was a friend of mine and worked on a hard day's night and help as executive producer. See, Dennis mentioned again, they wanted someone to edit magical mystery tour film they had shot and Dennis suggested me. I was asked to go down and meet the Beatles at West Malling. Paul said, we want to get this done in a week. I replied, you have no chance if you see what's involved. They hadn't employed anyone to keep continuity notes and it was difficult to locate footage. Paul said, come and see the film. It's in Ringo's room. I went in and there was film everywhere on top of the table, on top of the wardrobe, everywhere. The Beatles were reviewing the daily rushes on Ringo's 16 millimeter projector. They had three different types of film stock. Eventually they employed a secretary to make continuity notes and everything got sorted. When we got to the editing stage, John and Paul would come in virtually every day and, and we would work from about 10 in the morning till about six or seven at night. They had many friends dropping in this little room in old Compton Street, Soho. John employed a friend to go out and shoot any material he thought would be useful to include in the film. I cut some inserts into George's Blue Jay Way sequence. Fans would drop in all day long and the Beatles would be very hospitable to them, but it was not getting the film edited. So I asked Paul to arrange for someone to be on the door so we could get on with the job. Mal Evans went on the door and they would ask me, where are we editing today, Roy? We would go to a different restaurant or coffee house every day. In the middle of editing, they'd pop off to another room and meditate for 20 minutes because they were into the Maharishi thing. It took about a month to get to know John. He was a really shy person and you have to prove yourself to him before he decided to communicate. This came for me with the I am the walrus number. We had only edited half the sequence when we realized there was not enough film shot to complete the song as it was very long. So I said to John, give me a couple hours to work on it. He looked at me almost disbelievingly and went away. I took out all the trims of the film, the bits you don't have, and cut out all the interesting pieces, laying them into the most interesting visual movement of action. I joined them together and synchronized them to the music to see the effect. At that point, John returned and both he and I were overjoyed that it worked so well. For John though, his emotions were only in a knowing nod and smile, but I knew I had captured his respect. Incidentally, the starbursts you see at a couple of different intervals in the film were put there to cover the possibility of us having to break for commercial advertisement in the film. After the Magical Mystery Tour was virtually completed, John wanted us to use some unused footage for a full color promo film for Hello Goodbye. So we put together about three minutes of film, which included the luncheon at the Atlantic Hotel, footage shot in Nice, etc. To this day, the film has never been seen. We had two machines going at the same time, one 16 millimeter for MMT and another 35 millimeter for Hello Goodbye promos and I needed to get MMT finished. So I said rather abruptly, I must get MMT finished before we can start work on the promos. They were all taken aback for a moment and John wrote on the editing bench, Roy freaked out today, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Eventually I got all the sequences from the Magical Mystery Tour together. They couldn't believe they could get a film out of it. The Beatles were amazed. It was running for about an hour and 15 minutes and I edited down to 52 minutes. The Magical Mystery Tour party, which I find so interesting. This is from Pete's book. On December 21st, the Beatles previewed Magical Mystery Tour at a fancy dress party for their friends, employees, and fellow pop luminaries. I had initially planned to turn up as a musketeer, but at the last minute, John suddenly exclaimed, let's just go as teddy boys and dress the way we always wish we could when we were at school. Let's do it properly this time. Accordingly, we scoured John's extensive wardrobe for some suitably tight trousers and a couple of black leather jackets and greased our hair back into old Tony Curtis style. We both made a terrific impression at the party, but we were nonetheless eclipsed by such inspired impersonations as Peter Brown's periwigged King Louis XIV of France and Apple Press officer Derek Taylor's Nazi uniformed Hitler. Haven't found a picture of that. Maybe editing Lars. Well, did you? Good luck, baby. I believe in you, but if you can't, I'm not mad. Hey, don't get mad at me. I'm not the one who did it, okay? Scylla Black and her husband, Bobby Willis, came as respectively a Cockney laborer and a nun, while George and Judy Martin made a stunning entrance as the Duke of Edinburgh and Queen Elizabeth. We all duly formed a line bowing and curtsying as Philip and Liz extended limp handshakes. The most realistic impersonation of all, however, was achieved by Freddie Lennon, with whom John was still on speaking terms, who appeared as a trash collector. That morning, I was told Freddie had paid his dust band five pounds to swap 
clothes with him, and he hadn't even been bothered to wash the uniform in the interim. As a result, John's dad literally reeked of garbage, and all the other party goers did their utmost to keep him at a safe distance. By the time we were seated for the screening, John had, in best Teddy Boy style, got himself smashed on good old-fashioned booze. Just as in the good old days, moreover, the alcohol seemed to accentuate the more aggressive aspects of John's personality. When he found that the two of us had been placed at different tables, he made a nasty little scene with Alistair Taylor, who, as usual, had been put in charge of the seating arrangements. Another unpleasant scene developed toward the end of the party when a band took on stage and most of the guests paired off to dance. Totally ignoring Sin, who was decked out for the occasion as a fairy princess, John instead lavished his attentions on Patty Harrison, with whom he actually went so far as to dance, probably for the first time in about five years. Though Patty had undeniably made herself especially desirable as a scantily clad belly dancer, neither Sin nor George were the least bit amused by John's open flirtation with her. In the end, however, it was Sin's close friend, the diminutive pop star Lulu, impersonating Shirley Temple, complete in an oversized lollipop who elected to give herself the inebriated beetle come teddy boy a good talking to. George Martin says, Since the whole of London knew that the party was going to happen and wanted to come, security had to be very tight, but the boys still insisted on fancy dress. That had some offbeat results. Scylla Black, for instance, came as a cockney coster monger in a flat cap and trousers, and her husband, Bobby Willis, came as a nun. Bobby has a very pale complexion, and in a nun's habit, he looked incredibly authentic. He was in his outfit when he and Scylla drove in their Rolls Royce Cornish convertible to pick up a friend at Westbury Hotel en route to the party. He could see their friend waiting and drove straight to the hotel entrance where taxis were piling up. In so doing, he blocked the way for a moment. A commissioner immediately pounced, excuse me, sister, he said, but I'm afraid we can't leave our car here. Would you mind putting it around the corner? Bobby looked straight in the eye and replied, why don't you piss off? The look on the man's face is said to have been a study in sheer disbelief. Judy and I went as the queen and Prince Philip, which was an in joke. The boys always thought she sounded like the monarch and whenever they saw her would ask, how's your husband and you? I acquired an Admiral of the Fleet's uniform from one of the naval outfitters. Since they wouldn't let me have a sword, I put in my old observer's wings on the sleeve out of sheer cussedness. Judy had a lovely tiara and silk ball dress, blue sash with some star and garter type of apparatus draped across her bosom, and a handbag a dangle from her left wrist. Paul told me afterward, you know, your entrance was very striking. People formed themselves into a line, bowing and curtsying, while Judy and I gave limp handshakes to one and all. In the background, someone said loudly, my god, I didn't think they'd get them. <laughs> so they watched the movie and everybody loved it there. But when they played it on the BBC on Boxing Day, did they love it there? No, they did not. The way that I'm seated while I'm watching this, the desk shakes, and so I try my best to keep it from doing that, but it does do it a couple times. I'm sorry, the way that I'm sitting now, it won't do that as much, so we're growing and learning as people. So just, you know, make, um, make accommodations for yourself as we get through this bumpy ride. But during the movie, it does happen a couple times. Okay, different facty facts, but here we are. It cost 40,000 pounds to make. The BBC paid 9,000 pounds to air it on December 26, 1967, as we know. It was aired in black and white. <laughs> On January 5th, 1968, it ran in color on BBC, but there were only 200,000 color sets in the UK. Because of poor reviews in the UK, the US decided not to run the film. It was aired for the first time in the US on August 11th, 1968 for a fundraiser for the Liberation News Services. It was not shown publicly until 1974 when New Line Cinema purchased the rights. It was released for the first time in 1978 on VHS slash Betamax, but removed from the market in 1980 due to a lawsuit. There is unique identification to this with a different roll up, roll up John track in the first scenes of the bus zoom in and out showing stars with lines above it, creating a falling star effect. It had washed out color and is very poor quality and is run in the incorrect 23.976 frames per second presentation. The film is 25 FPS. In 1981, there was a UK release on VHS. It was a poor quality print. In 1988, it was released on VHS and Laserdisc with a remastered slash remixed soundtrack by George Martin, still with the different roll-up roll-up and the zoom ins, but was aired in the correct 25 frames per second. There was a 1992 Laserdisc release and then a 1997, the first DVD release with the standard intro, but the falling stars had been removed. 
in 2012 there was a DVD and Blu-ray release. This is the one that we're watching which has been cleaned up to 2080p and has commentary by Paul which we have seen. The film was parodied by the Ruddles in 1978 as a tragical history tour. It's been suggested that I watch and react to them several times and I probably should. On December 27th Paul went on David Frost to defend Magical Mystery Tour and it's funny because Hunter Davies, um, a Beatles biographer, says that it was the first time an artist felt the need to publicly apologize for something that they'd put out. I listened to that interview. It is brutal. <laughs> David Frost said that he watched the film that day but he'd watch it in color and he said that he liked it. First off the audio by the way of this interview rough. I'm gonna try to clean it up and see if I can make any of it make sense but it's a 23 minutes and they spend a lot of time talking about it. He asks Paul what he thinks like does he still like it? What do you think about the public perception and Paul was kind of like I still like it you know and he stands up for his stuff and he says you know um, he understands why people didn't like it. He was defensive but not in a mean way or anything. He seemed to have charmed the audience but it's hard to know because we don't have any footage of this. There are audience questions but it is hard to understand them. I'm going to listen to it again and hopefully there will be more bits that I can put in and out but he says things like you know I think people were looking for a plot and we didn't really have one. He says that the plot is quite thin and that they knew that but it was more of a fun thing for them to do. It was an expression of their own in more of like an art film type thing. I am actually gonna go into this interview at the end of the video if you wanna stick around for more in-depth conversation about it. Um, that's at the end. As a Get Back freak, I guess I should say that the only mention of Magical Mystery Tour in Get Back is during discussions of budget and what they should do for their final unbeknownst to them live show. Dennis O'Dell, who I've mentioned a couple of times here, as well as Paul and Michael Lindsay Hogg and even John, scoffed at the mention of a budget. It didn't matter. They're the Beatles they can get whatever they want. I think it should be the least of our worries. Money. Really good. George, being ever so practical and bringing up concerns that should have been taken much more seriously, said this about the cost of the film. I know it's going to cough up all your dealers. Stuff. They <laughs> made back the money. The cost to buy the film for Magical Mystery. We should be able to get First off, the most colorful film, like second to Wizard of Oz, was shown in black and white. First strike. <laughs> Big strike. Second off, it was kind of weird. Before I inundate you with so many quotes, I have to tell you that the movie was so heavily disliked that no one archived a negative properly, causing later releases to have horrible quality. They eventually released an updated version, but still not the best. Jeff says they got it done, but the airing turned out to be a disaster. The public either hated what they saw or didn't understand it, and the band were handed their first critical drubbing ever. Part of the problem came from the fact that the film was broadcast in black and white, although it was shot in color. But I think a bigger factor was that because of all the hype and build-up, everyone simply expected too much from it. The Beatles were musicians, not filmmakers, and Magical Mystery Tour was never conceived as a great work of art, just a bit of fun. Having said all that, it still comes across as a bit amateurish and self-indulgent. It's really just a mishmash of ideas, no more and no less. Did the group deserve the savaging they got from the press? Probably not, but it seems to be an unfortunate human trait that we are all too anxious to tear down our idols once we have built them up. My attitude is that it was simply a starting point for Paul and his career in film. After all, you've got to start somewhere even if you make mistakes along the way. Tony Barrow says, the biggest star of Magical Mystery Tour is the music, a fact conveniently overlooked by critics in their rush to consign the Beatles to history. MMT contains some of the boys' finest work, including the only live performances of I'm the Walrus and the spectacular The Fool on the Hill. Once again, monochrome reduces colorful set pieces to dullness of dishwater. Yes, the film itself may be flawed, but the music certainly isn't. It is arguable that Magical Mystery Tour is far more popular now than in the late 60s in arguments substantiated by sales of the video. My personal opinion is that it was ahead of its time, something which could be said about so much of the Beatles' output. Certainly, it has many happy memories for me, and it was a project which I found myself involved in from the very beginning to the very end and beyond. I think the high spot for me was really the music. I think to be able to include I Am The Walrus was a great bonus for us. Alan Clayson talks about how Ringo was trying to off-put people's concerns Concerns. He'd pull forebodings about formless eccentricities with phrases such as aimed at the widest possible audience, children, their grandparents, beetle people, the low, the interesting things to look at, the interesting things to hear. On the last, few could say that it, the music was a letdown as demonstrated by the Magical Mystery Tour EP, costing three times more than a single, almost topping Britain's Yuletide chart. The labored surrealism of the film, however, wasn't a ticket for a nation in the hiatus between a cold turkey tea time and mid-evening in sobriety. It was 
was not damned immediately by underground periodicals who had been determined to like it, but elsewhere, it just freaked everybody out, groaned Star years later, which was a pity. If it came out today, it would be more accepted. I always loved Magical. We all did. Was his loyal addenda, knowing full well how uncomfortable John and George had been about it from the beginning. From an admittedly prejudiced perspective, Pete Best was even more scathing in retrospect about Magical Mystery Tour, quote, the psychedelic stuff. After that, as far as my own taste was concerned, it was waning. Pete shot and said, though I personally rather enjoyed the film, the faces on the screen were, after all, those of my friends. Magical Misery Tour was, in truth, hardly more noteworthy than an 8mm home movie. A qualified scriptwriter or director, an Alan Owen or Richard Lester, might have turned the project into something genuinely worthwhile. The Beatles, however, had come to imagine that their every inspiration and brainstorm could somehow be translated into reality without the benefit of such professionally trained intermediaries, and that the spontaneous magic they had always invinced in their music making would now serve them in equal success in such unrelated fields as, say, film or the retail clothing business. It was a delusion that was soon to cost them dearly. Indeed, following Magical Mystery Tours airing to the general public on December 26th as a BBC TV Christmas special, the critics instantly pronounced it the Beatles' first unqualified flop. Vindictive though the notices may have been, chaotic, appalling, a colossal conceit, and blatant rubbish were just a few of the barbs that were hurled at the Beatles in the next morning papers. They nonetheless constituted quite a rude awakening for John, Paul, George, and Ringo. For the first time in years, the Beatles were reminded that they might not, after all, be Superman. George Martin says, Everyone said it was pretentious and overblown, but it was kind of an avant-garde video, if you like. The Beatles were the first guys to make videos. They're accepted now as part of our business, and Magical Mystery Tour was a rather fanciful example. It was a little bit pretentious, but it was also quite good. Maybe it was a little boring, and maybe some of the songs weren't great, but it was an attempt. John says, They thought we were stepping out of our roles. They like to just keep us in cardboard suits that were designed for us. Whatever image they have for themselves, they're disappointed if we don't fulfill it. And we never do, so there's always a lot of disappointment. I don't think we have any responsibility to the fans. You give them the choice of liking what you're doing or not liking it. If they don't like it, they let you know fast. If you allow everything to be dictated by the fans, you're just running your life for other people. All we do is try to give fans an even deal. Paul says, it was shown on BBC One on Boxing Day, which is traditionally Music Hall and Bruce Forsyth and Jimmy Tarbuck time. Now we had this very stoned show on just when everybody's getting over Christmas. I think a few people were surprised. The critics certainly had a field day and said, oh, disaster, disaster. Was it really as bad as that? It wasn't the worst program over Christmas. I mean, you couldn't call the Queen speech a gas either, could you? People like Steven Spielberg have said since, when I was in film school, that was a film that we really took notice of. It was an art film rather than a proper film, and I think we all thought it was okay. It wasn't the greatest thing we'd ever done, but I defend it anyway. On the lines that nowhere else do you see a performance of I Am The Walrus. That's the only performance ever. I think things like that are enough to make it an interesting film. And John's dream with the spaghetti too. That was an actual dream where he came in and said, hey, I had this wild dream last night. I'd like to do it. I'm a waiter. So we just put all these ideas in and it was very haphazard. It's how you learn by your mistakes. Not that it was a mistake overall, but there were millions and millions of little mistakes going along. We never had clapper boards, for instance, so when we came to edit with the music, it was very difficult. Ooh, that would suck. <laughs> we took two weeks by to edit it, and it took 11. So I've heard... 11 and I've heard six and seven. So I don't know. So it went slightly over budget on the editing. I would be down in Soho with the editor all day. It was my job and the guys would drop by. So I suppose I'm quite a bit to blame for that. At the same time, I'm quite proud of it. It was daring, even though back then it was certainly shown at the wrong time to the wrong audience. Ringo says, being British, we thought we'd give it to the BBC, which in those days was the biggest channel who showed it in black and white. We were stupid and they were stupid. It was hated. They all had their chance to say they've gone too far. Are, who do they think they are? What does it mean? It was like the rock opera situation. They're not Beethoven. They were still looking for things that made sense and this was pretty abstract. It was a crowd of people having a lot of fun with whatever came into mind. It was really slated, but of course, when people started seeing it in color, they realized it was a lot of fun. In a weird way, I certainly feel it stood the test of time, but I can see that somebody watching it in black and white would lose so much of it. It would make no sense, especially the aerial ballet shot. We sent a guy out filming all over Iceland and then it was shown in black and white. I mean, what? What is this? Painted silly clowns and magicians? What does it mean? You have to remember that anything we did in the early days was a love song. Love me do. I want to hold your hand. Please please me. Blah -dee blah. And now suddenly I'm the walrus and you let your knickers down. Oh my god, what are they doing? They've gone too far. There are always a lot of people who have said they've gone too far this time. So let's go watch it. Let's go see where they fucked up. Hi, it's 13th version of me here. I have some news. We lost her. We tried but we lost her. 
it means that I have to narrate the movie because we cannot watch it together. Seriously? Seriously, YouTube copyright system. Does this mean that I'm going to be narrating this and showing overlay of footage a la Lost Project? You bet your beautiful bunny butt that it does. Beautiful bunny butt. Scripting Lars is so fucking weird. The movie opens with a mishmash of scenes and b-roll from the movie, including but not limited to not Cynthia Lennon, but oh my god looks like Cynthia Lennon, a very quick shot of the bikini scene, and pole sniffing a flower, and many variations of the bugs waving from the sunroof. Ringo goes into the ticket shop and buys tickets for the magical mystery tour. We see him and his aunt, Jesse Robbins, just a walking down the street singing do ah diddy diddy dum diddy do and they're running late but they make it just in the nick of time for us to meet our beginning cast members our courier jolly jimmy robinson played by Derek royal and our hostess wendy winters played by miranda forbes credited as mandy wheat still not cynthia lennon but my god cynthia lennon we learn of our characters the photographer george clayton the conductor buster blood vessel the starlet played by maggie wright and the rubber man nat jackley and for the life of me I could not tell you why he's named that. <laughs> All the while Ringo and his aunt Jessie argue about who really paid for the tickets and how she's not been the same since her husband died. As the bus tour gets going we segue into Fool on the Hill where we see Paul dancing and skipping amidst a beautiful backdrop of Nice France and the pink clouds above them. By the way in Paul's commentary for the movie which I've mentioned a few times but I had to cut it all out I'm so sorry it will be in the director's version. <laughs> He talks about tarot cards and how when he got readings, he always pulled the fool card and he thought, well, that's kind of a rub. What about the king or whatever? But then he learned that the fool is quite a positive card and past Lars explained it. And I know no one wants this, but it's the 13th version and I get what I want now. <laughs> I can tell you why, actually. My favorite deck is a Game of Thrones deck. I read tarot. Only for myself. I don't make money off of it. I don't do it that often, actually. So here is Tyrion. And in this scene, he is freeing dragons in an underground basement. Okay? They've been in the dark and underfed for a long time at this point. He goes down and says, not going to hurt you. Okay? I'm going to free you. I'm here to help. Don't eat the help. And it is like so scary and he lets them go and they go out and everything is fine. And he goes up and says, never let me do that again. Oh my God, that was the dumbest thing I've ever done. Next time I have an idea like that, punch me in the face. But his hopefulness was actually incredibly helpful and it was the best outcome but it was incredibly foolish. And I think that that's one of the best ways to describe the card. Paul gets a lot of the best outcome, but sometimes he's incredibly foolish. And I say that with a big, big, big love for Paul. The actual story of the making of this video, in fact, illustrates my point exactly. Paul went alone to film this with Mal and a cameraman. It was not strictly legal and definitely not union approved, but as we've established, I'm quite American. I do not know what I'm talking about. Paul is so used to other people taking care of things for him that he forgot his passport. So once they get to the airport, he's like, forgot it in France. And they're like, okay, fine. So they get to France and it's time to leave. And he says, forgot it in England. And they say, okay, fine. And he uses his charm and his name to get through this. And it works this time, but it doesn't always work. See, Japan arrest. Quick shot of back on the bus and then we are in a military office with Victor Spinetti yelling intelligibly but with such vigor that it could be described as inspirational. Even in this field with a stuffed cow, his passion is admirable. Wouldn't you say? A field race gives way to a car race, the only scene that I cannot stand and truly cannot show you a single clip of. Back in the field, a band plays and photos are taken. George Clayton, our photographer, takes a photo and when he goes under the hood, the hood? It's, is it called the hood? He goes under the hood and when he comes back out, he's wearing a lion's head. This is an example of the absurdist humor that inspired the film. Back on the bus, Jolly Jimmy says, if you look to the right, the view is quite unremarkable, but if you look to the left and then it's 
flying. The video shots of scenery that Dennis O'Dell provided outtakes from Dr. Strange Love, which they added Technicolor effects to, something that would be lost on a viewer in black and white on BBC One and not shown in color on BBC Two until January 5th. Just a thought. Above the clouds, we meet our four or five magicians. It's the Beatles and Mal. A very impatient Ringo is pestering the others. Where's the bus? Where's the bus? George says, it's coming. He finally demands, where is the bus? And Paul checks his charts and says, it's 10 miles away just on Dewsbury Road. On the bus, we see sunken Roman ruins and Aunt Jessie and Buster Blood Vessel strike up a conversation and immediately fall in love. We shortly see them kissing passionately on the beach. He draws a heart around her. This is the only scene that the BBC cut because it was too weird. Back on the bus shows a very stern Buster Blood Vessel and a confused Aunt Jessie. The viewer starts to wonder, is this a dream or is this real? The only performance of I Am The Walrus is shown next, and I cannot show you a single thing from it. Maybe this still? Mm, sorry. Back on the bus, the magic is really changing things. We see John and George with little Nicola having fun and playing. Ringo and Aunt Jessie argue as much as ever. Then there's the spaghetti scene. That's it, that's the whole thing, I'm leaving it. Next, everyone goes into a very small tent and winds up in an AA meeting. They are served popcorn and given a quick show by Jolly Jimmy and the Starlet. Blue Jay Way is played on a projector and they leave the tent as they came. Then the bus flattens it entirely. <laughs> The magicians are working on their tricksy tricks and Jean said that he spent a half hour looking for the sugar. Paul says that the tourists are having a wonderful time and George says that what's next is the song on the bus, an old fashioned sing along. At the next stop, the ladies go with Miss Wendy Winters and the gentlemen go with Jolly Jimmy to see a strip tease, which was accompanied by the Bonzo Dog Doodah band, I'm getting better at it. And they wrap it with these teeth and I was so happy the first time I saw it. The movie wraps with your mother should know a very over-the-top scene that is reminiscent of White Christmas, our boys in white tie and tail. I always see a joke that George looks so angry here because they've been working on the steps for a very long time and he was frustrated, but he doesn't look angry for the rest of the scene, but John does look maniacal right here. It's one for the history book. And that is the copyright approved version of Magical Mystery Tour, the movie. God, I loved it. I did not like it that much the first time. I had a fun time watching it. And I was like, God, that was fun. That was fun. No, I really liked it this time. I really, really liked it. I don't know if that even came across like so much as I just had a blast watching it. I just watched the commentary right before this. I was really happy to watch this again. I, I think that that was really fun. I mean, yeah, I guess I see if you're like looking for a movie and you're like, damn, that wasn't really a movie, but I don't think that it's like particularly any less movie-esque than help. It's just less racist. I mean, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Jump scare, editor Lars doesn't need makeup. Makeup in this economy, you're kidding, right? Okay, so as frustrating as this is, I'm re-filming my reaction to the deleted scene, even though it had a really good reaction to it because the audio was absolutely screwed up. My initial reaction was awesome, but I can assure you that any sort of enthusiasm I have this time will still be just as genuine because I was still just very happy about filming it. <laughs> this is important. And if you've stuck around this late into the video, then you'd want to know this. This deleted drummer scene is from Project Abbey Road. And there was a comment here. Don't know how you got this. But my dad always used to talk about this scene where my grandmother played drums in the film, but it wasn't shown in the final cut. Great find. I guess I just wanted to read that little quote. You can't confirm what somebody says in the comments on YouTube. However, in case that's true, that seems really neat. So I just wanted to read that. So some of the stuff you'll, you'll see here and such, um... Look, there's a clapper board, but some of the stuff you'll see here is from different cameras, not quite synced up audio. It will also have varying degrees of quality because this was not, this was hastily and haphazardly edited and thrown together. Right here, we're seeing Nat Jackley. This is the one who got really frustrated with not having an actual script. So we're seeing them kind of fuck around and he's playing it up. The first time I saw this, I was like, it almost looks like he's eating cinnamon here. I don't know why. 
why I felt that way. But anyway, this was him, you know, joking around. And and it's kind of funny, actually, in the commentary of The Fool on the Hill, Paul says not to smoke, that it's a nasty habit. I see we're all smoking away. Don't do it, children. It's a bad habit. And I love, love John's hat here. And we've got little Nicola right there with Paul right here thing. Yeah, see here she is. Isn't that cute? We see a lot of the same shots repeated over and over again. And then we finally get into the best part of the scene, which is Aunt Jessie playing the drums. Now I need to say the audio, even though this is a lot better than it was going to be, bad, bad audio. Okay. So it is, if you have sensitive ears, I'm sorry. It is sonically devastating. <laughs> She's got an absolutely infectious laugh and I am going to be pausing in between talking rather than having it playing. Look at him. He is absolutely digging it. Oh, it's still so good. It's still so good. This is so annoying because I can't have my mic going this as the same time as the speakers because of how bad the feedback is. So I can't like actively live react, but it's so fucking good. Ah, uh, tell me that's not awesome. Tell me that's not awesome. That was awesome. I love it. It's so fun. God, there's nothing like a good groove. Oh, look at them just jamming. So she's talking to Mal and she says, oh, baby, baby, look what you're doing to me. Look, look. Oh, baby, baby, look what you do. There's Magic Alex giving her flowers. That would have been really a great addition to this movie. The rest of this scene is mostly just music and them eating. The drum scene is mostly the, the focus of the deleted scene. And I think it was very fun and I'm glad that I had a chance to watch it. Twice. <laughs> I do want to talk a little bit about the David Frost interview because it is, you know, 22 minutes. And I did try to clear up the audio, but it just didn't happen guys it just didn't i'm not gonna read the whole thing out we don't have 22 minutes i have a rough cut of the video right now and it's two hours and eight minutes and i still have some things to add in so we're we're not doing that right now <laughs> basically they get right into it and david frost says why don't you think that the critics liked this film he says they just didn't seem to like it i quite liked myself david frost said i liked it but i didn't see it last night because i was busy harsh. And then he said, but I saw it today. Why were people so puzzled by it? Paul says, I think a lot of people were looking for a plot and there wasn't one. And David Frost says, I saw it in color. That sort of helped too. Paul goes on to say, we thought we could just do a thing. See, we've been waiting for a couple years now to make another feature film. And we've been asking people to write stories and write plots, but nobody's come up with one, you know, he says. We talked about this earlier. There were a couple of things, but they never really found something that they were that enthralled with. So we thought we'll do something which isn't like that, which isn't like a real film in as much as it's got a story and a beginning. And we'll just do a selection of, you know, we'd put together a lot of things that we'd like the look of and see what happens. David goes on to ask, did you have a point? Did you have like a reason behind the film? Was there a reason? And Paul says, no, see, that's the trouble seriously. And I've listened to this audio. It's pretty bad, but got to do everything with a point or an aim. But we tried this one without anything with no point or no aim. And when you make a songs, they don't always have to fit in with each other. They're just a selection of songs. But when you make a film, you seem to have to have a thread to pull it all together. Paul goes on to basically say, it grows on you. And he's like, maybe they'll play it 17 times. And he says, is the fact that it didn't get across to a lot of people, does that fact alter your opinion of it? Do you say, right, it seems to have failed? Or do you think it's precisely as good as if people had said it was very good? And he said, yeah, I think it's as good as I always thought it was. But when we were making, I think all of us thought this has got a very thin plot. We hope this idea of doing a thing without a plot works. The one thing we're going to be able to say is it hasn't got a plot. But yeah, 
we thought you don't need a plot. You don't always need one because like the things that you did today probably didn't have much of a plot. <laughs> Paul says that it was a success failure and he says you can't say it was a success because the papers didn't like it. And that's what people read to find out what's a success, but he thinks it's all right. And he thinks that the next one will be a lot better and it will have a fat plot, which was Yellow Submarine and I haven't seen it, so I couldn't tell you. I purposely try not to know as much as I can about that one. That's the, I don't know very much about Yellow Submarine actually. So he says, what is success? How would you define that? So they get very philosophical for just a second. I don't know, I wouldn't try. I suppose, you know, I don't know how many people liked it who saw it. They like you much more than they liked it, you see, to the audience. But I mean, you better watch it again and again on BBC, but we know that it only played twice. Paul says 17 times. Can it be a success when people don't like it? And Paul says, it obviously matters. If this morning we'd awoke to find fantastic reviews, then we would have all said it's a success and I wouldn't have been on tonight, David. But it doesn't matter all that much because people said about two of our records, like Strawberry Fields and I'm the Walrus to name but two, they said, those are terrible, you know. You can't talk about let your knickers down on telly. You can't do it. But you can, you know. I've just done it. <laughs> <laughs> what a brat. And it's all right, you know, because in about a year or two, these things that didn't look like successes will look a bit more like successes, you know, as people get into that kind of thing. And guess what? It, it took a little bit more than a couple years, but people do like it, you know? But are they saying this is the strongest plot ever? No, obviously not. It's just a bunch of people going on a magical bus tour. You said today somewhere, if this first film that you made yourselves had been a rave, then there wouldn't have been a point in doing any more. What did you mean? He said there would have been a point, but it wouldn't have been as much as a challenge to do the next one. At least now we know that we haven't got all that much to live up to. Let's see. They go on to talk about Maharishi and other things. He discourages kids from doing drugs. <laughs> They spend a good chunk of these 22 minutes talking about the movie. They eventually move on, but it did take a pretty, like, serious note for a bit. So that was interesting. I thought it was uh, worth going into for a second. So this is me hours earlier saying good evening. I really appreciate you for sticking around this long. Holy crap. I have no idea how long it's going to be, but I think it's going to be over two hours. Um... Oops, oops, sorry. I'm so glad that y'all stuck around with me and really dug into Magical Mystery Tour. I think that this movie and album is so interesting and gets so much flack for no reason, no reason whatsoever. You go back and watch and you come to me, baby, and tell me what you thought now. What did you think? How did you feel? Do you agree, disagree? Do you wanna fight? Are you still upset that you found out I was fat? Sincerely, truly, I had a blast working on this. I'm so entrenched in this thing. And because of that, I am going to start a Patreon once I hit 2000 subscribers. Obviously low tiers, a couple bucks, but I work really hard on this and I would eventually like to be able to have private live streams where we could listen to some Beatles music together because we deserve that much, okay? So anyway, that's coming soon. And if you watch to the end, you might be one of those people who would be willing to support my hard, hard work. And I work so hard. I would absolutely love it if you guys would like and subscribe and all of that jazz. Give me a comment. I check comments for the first couple of days. And then after that, I say goodbye. I love y'all so much. And y'all come back now, you hear? Bye. My sweet Lord. Mm, my Lord. Mm. Lord, but it takes so long, my Lord, my sweet Lord. I'd like to take a second now and take a little stroll down memory lane. Do you like a stroll down memory lane? I'll go along with this premise. <laughs> you, why? It's just me. We're buddies. Aren't we buddies? I'm completely relaxed. I don't know why there's an accusation <laughs> that I'm in some way perturbed.